Ladies and gentlemen, people of all gender expressions, thank you for checking out the North Bank Media Podcast. I am your host, Patrick Strevens. Joining me on the show this afternoon was Will Cardinal Maurer. Will is a man of Cree, Métis descent. Uh, he's a community support worker at the Bissell Centre in Edmonton, and he is an outspoken advocate for Indigenous rights uh, in this country. Um, Will was introduced to me by Brittany Ohi, who, if you've listened to this show at all, you've likely heard me mention the episode that her and I did uh, back in February, uh, which is a very important episode for me personally and for the show, I think. Uh, but for her to introduce me now to someone else uh, who is a little bit more boots on the ground, who is legitimately a member of these minority communities, um, was very important, and I want to thank her for that. I think Will and I had a really productive discussion. I found it enlightening. I found it informative. I think in retrospect, maybe there were things that I would have liked to push further on, but at the same time, I'm really working hard here to have the mandate of you know, I'm not the one looking for debate. I'm not the one passing the moral judgment. I simply want to hear in, a, in, a, in a, an open way, in a, in a constructive way about uh, the guest's story and, and their beliefs. And so you may say that some of Will's politics are fairly radical, but again, that's his point of view. And he was more than happy to share it in a pretty cogent and clear way, I thought. Uh, we recorded this episode uh, outdoors on a Pretty beautiful day uh, at Edmonton's Indigenous Art Park, which is just sort of south of the um, Walterdale Bridge across the street from Queen Elizabeth Park, ironically. Uh, I should also mention that Will is um, sort of doing some advocacy work for a case that is currently awaiting trial, I believe. That's the case uh, in the shooting deaths of uh, Jacob Sansom and Morris Cardinal. Those were his relatives, and he I didn't know that until later in the conversation, so he... He shared some details about that. If, if that's something you'd like to know more about, I'll, I'll put some stuff in the show notes to help you uh, learn more about that. But uh, just a real tragic case. And I, again, was not aware that those were his family members. So to hear to hear that from him was uh, impactful for sure. Um, I don't want to preface it too much more. I think both of our views are laid pretty bare uh, in this conversation. So please enjoy this one. This is a great one with Will Cardinal Maurer. Yeah, it'll be good. We'll see what happens. Yeah, right. it's from the heart, man. <laughs> right, it's, I'm not course. asking you anything you don't know the answers to. Right, right. Alrighty. Well, Will, thanks for being here, man. It's great to finally sit down with you. Yes, yes. Nice to meet you, Patrick. It is. It's yeah. uh, It's been a long journey to get you here. I know you're a busy guy going through some stuff, but uh, yeah. how are you doing these days? Um, I'm doing okay. Okay. Um, been. It's been quite heavy the past couple of weeks okay. with um, kind of the current events of what's going on sure. in Kamloops and of course um, around Canada. Mm -hmm. So um, just kind of balancing that and work, um, just, uh, yeah, just kind of trying to stay positive. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And so now, now for my info and for the listeners, you Cree descent, is that yes, that's correct? Yes, um, I'm, I'm Métis okay. Cree uh, from Wolf Lake Métis Settlement. Okay. Um, it was a, it's disbanded now in the 1960s, but it's originally in between Lac La Biche and Bonneville, Alberta. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah so, so my no, mom north. is, yeah, my mom, my mom is Cree, and, okay. uh, and then my dad is Caucasian, he's American, actually. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. um... That's interesting. Do you have much knowledge of your family bloodlines going back generations? or um, I have a little bit of knowledge, um, basically just up to like the past, I guess, 50 years. I know some stories, mm -hmm. um, but that's about it. I okay. don't know much. I know, I know up to when the provincial government gave uh, my, like my family um, settlement status, and I know when the government... Uh, took it away oh. yeah and so that's about yeah that's sure about the, his the, the history i have gave it and then took it away has, yeah. has kind of been the story yes right <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely um the settlements are actually only provincial okay um so only that you'll only find them in alberta saskatchewan and manitoba interesting um and it's because uh, like treaty if you're status mm -hmm. indigenous um 
you are you live on a reservation, you have okay. a band, okay. a band number. Um, but Métis people, um, at, at least in Alberta and Manitoba and Saskatchewan, uh, we have settlement communities. Okay. So there's a difference between reservations and settlements. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Is there a di- is there a difference? practically in like quality of life on those settlements? Or, um, or? I would say because the, um, the reservation system, it has definitely been more forgotten um, okay. because it's run federally, right? Versus sure, sure. The, the provincial. Uh, they've, I mean, they've done an okay job mm-hmm. at like keeping the, the settlements um, uh, going, going, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's interesting you say, you know, life, things have been heavy the last few weeks because of something that happened completely uh, outside of your life. Right. In some sense, we're right. talking about the discovery in Kamloops. Yeah. But also, someone like you who's passionate about the, I would say, the activism, and you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're in the community, you, you are an abor- uh, indigenous. indigenous guy. Yes. There we go. I knew yes. I'd get it. There we go. You're an indigenous guy. Um, and you take that on. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? Um, honestly... It was, uh, so I grew up in like a very, like, uh, I grew up in a very white dominant community, sure. um, farming community. Mm. Um, Iron River, Alberta is kind of the area. It's actually just south of where the, um, uh, where the, the settlement originally was. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's just like a little farming community. And so I kind of grew up very disconnected from my culture, mm. very, um, very separated from it. Okay. Um, and I never really got a chance. I never really got opportunities to to connect with it up until I graduated high school and like moved to the city mm-hmm. about ten years ago. Um, but it was during my time growing up in this like rural community where I did never saw myself as indigenous. Mm. I just um, I was just you know one of the kids, right? right. They. Um, and and at the same time having no and the only other indigenous kids i ever saw come through this tiny school that i went to they were usually in like a foster home or 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 in group group home okay um and there was a couple of those in the community and um and so of course growing up i always was curious why i would only see these indigenous kids for such a short time they would come in for a year so i I went to a school kindergarten to grade nine only a hundred students um so of course going to the school you know everybody in the school right yeah yeah. um and so you know an indigenous kid would come through the school and you know i'd befriend them and we would be good pals Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the next year they're gone and i've never you know i'd never see them again and um it actually wasn't until I started working with um, Edmonton's uh, homeless community back in, so about 10 years ago when I first moved to Edmonton, okay. that was like one of the first jobs I got basically. And, um, and all of a sudden uh, I'm working at the Hope Mission Youth Shelter and I see this, some of the same kids oh, wow. staying in the shelter yeah. that I went to school with, you know, back when we were kids. Mm. And, uh, and I just, it was kind of like an awakening mm-hmm. where I was like, at one point we were, you know, on the same level and, sure. you know, and, uh, and actually this person who I saw come into the shelter, you know, we were quite close when we were younger and mm-hmm. they asked me later that day, like we used to go to each other's birthday parties. So oh, they asked, they asked me later that shift that night, yeah. uh, they asked me, how did your life go this way? Wow. And how did my life go that way? You know, and I really had to take a look and kind of check myself and see uh, what what happened in my life that, you know, offered me um, the supports and the safeties, you know, sure. that I had versus that uh, she had. And, and I kind of, and that's kind of when, I, and I, I was like, well, this isn't an isolated incident. You know, there's got to be more kids like this, you know. And, sure. and sure enough, I find out, of the 14, there was 14 indigenous kids that I grew up with in Iron River. Okay. Um, and out of the 14 of them, I'd say 12 ended up homeless. And this is, and this is like, you know, 70 family. This is like, this is like small town, sure, you sure. know, rural Alberta. And, and then I was like, well, there's, and then seeing um, Edmonton's homeless population, um, 60%, upwards to 60% indigenous. Okay. Right. And, um, and then you see in the prisons, you know, specifically, especially in uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, upwards to 70% of men and women in prison are Indigenous. And you have over 60% of children in care in Canada are Indigenous. And then, I, you know, I see all of these statistics, sure. statistics and sure. I'm like, well, what, like, what's going on? You know, yeah. there's got to be something. And it just kind of started the ball rolling. Okay. Me just, um, just researching 
um, you know, what really happened mm. to, you know, indigenous people here. And, um, and there's a reason for this over-representation and when it comes to poverty and, mm. and, and crime, you know, and, and addiction. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. S- certainly there is. And it's, but, what does that look, is that quite plainly, it's, it's the trauma that has come down. It's yep. been the, you want to say oppression, the, yep. the inequality mm-hmm. of opportunity yep. 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 that has come down yep. since colonialization, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. Is yep. it, it's that cut and dry. It's not, it's yeah, not magic. It's not. No, and it, and you you don't. It's like it's not a mystery. You know, so many people would like to think it's you know something that it's like the, the information that we don't have. You mm-hmm. know, but it's so it's so very obvious, mm-hmm. right? That justice is unequally distributed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, and 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 even just the the complete erasure of you know the atrocities. Um, has really just kind of like, um, like just the censorship in, in the education system, right? I, th- I feel like the education system is super key into yes. transforming hearts and minds, right? And it starts young. It starts with the kids, you know? And, um, and I feel that, like, and I feel like obviously there's, there's so many people, right, who don't know about these things. Um, and, and it's not like... Um, I, you know, I never hold people responsible. Right. Um, you know, no one just wakes up one day and, you know, oh, I'm ignorant. You know, sure. I'm, I'm going to be racist today. You know, it's like, it's, they're conditioned. Yeah. You betcha. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Uh, no, this is just uh, my friend's t-shirt, actually. If you want to check yeah. it out, it's called, it's North Bank Media. The North Bank Media. Appreciate that. Yeah, this will be out next week. Uh, yeah, YouTube. Yep, Apple Podcasts. North, North Bank Media. Just all topic, like freelance. Yeah, it's anybody. Yeah. Free speech. Free speech is number one. Personal stories. Uh, that's awesome, guys. Yeah. Second question I got, Chris. Is there a nice lookout point to this? In- there is. Yeah, if you just go down this hill, you'll see there's a really nice open spot that looks over the Walter Dale, and there's some really cool Appreciate indigenous that, art down there. Yeah. yeah. Right, huh? You're a starting one. Awesome. Do it's it. easy, man. It. Two mics, two people. That's, that's all you need. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's all about. It is. It, that's yeah. Cool. Sorry that you people. did get cut off. No, there, that's okay. Can we? What was? Uh, um, just re- yeah. Just sure. Recenter. I, I, I think basically. Kind of sure. On. No, not a problem. Yeah. Uh, this is the hazard of doing it outside. Although exactly. I kind of like. The, it's nice the interaction. You have to, stuff. man. Yeah. It's humans is, being humans. Uh, totally. Yeah. Totally. I think we were talking basically about how, you know, colonization of this country. We see that even today mm-hmm. in the uh, in mm-hmm. the results, right. the, the trauma, right. whatever you want to say. Right. How, also, too, one thing that I learned about recently that I didn't know, like even the uh, indigenous concepts of justice do mm-hmm. not at all line up with colonial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're, we're dealing with two cultures here that will never... Never work. Right. So, never work, yeah. So honestly, I don't, there's, like a, there's an indigenous saying, and it's like there was... Uh, it's like there was a time before cops, you know, and there, sure. and there will be a time after. Um, okay. If you think about the entire justice system, like the entire police force this country is built on, their original job was to remove the original inhabitants. Like they were hired by the crown right. and they were, they were sent to Canada to, to, um, to secure the new colonies to secure law and order right. for the new colonies. And what they meant by law and order for the new colonies, it meant that there was some, you know, there was a bunch of, there was a bunch of native people hanging out in their backyard, right? <laughs> and, you know, we can't have that, right? No. We have a farm to build, sure. you know? So um, the Northwest Mounted Police, right. uh, originally, um, as, you know, we call them the RCMP now, um, but their original job was, yeah, to clear the plains. And, um, and their whole, even if you look up like the March West, mm-hmm. um, it's very much glorified and glamorized and romanticized as this like, you know, incredible feat for Canada, mm-hmm. but it's like- Progress. Progress, yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's even just funny today too, just busing here from the North side. Um, we, uh, the bus went by the, R- the RCMP headquarters oh. and, and of course they have a teepee. They have an RCMP oh. teepee. Interesting. So it's a teepee and the RCMP logo is on it and the RCMP colors are on it. And I, you know, as an, that- as an indigenous person, I see that and I'm just like, you guys know that 
like that was your job was to originally destroy those things. Yeah, rip those right? down. Yeah, and now to see you build one of your own and you know and place your colonial language on it, you know, is kind of yeah, kind of like a punch to the gut. It is that that hurts, hey? Like, yeah, it's it's one thing to have done it and to maybe not to be acknowledging it a little yeah. bit, along, but then to do something on a symbolic yeah. level. Yeah. Now, is that done out of ignorance? See that I. I don't think so. Okay. I feel like that is very calculated in the sense that um, I'll just can I I'll tell you a short story. Please, please. I'll kinda, I kind of I want to give you like the history of Mount Rushmore. Okay. In South Dakota. Yeah. Um, and so it kind of relates to you know this RCMP TP. Um, so originally let's, let's start with um, the lar- the largest mass hanging in sure. the United States history was um, well, what was it 38 38. Uh, Sioux people. Okay. And it was ordered by Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln signed off on it. Okay. Um, So Abraham Lincoln, yeah, was responsible for the largest mass hanging. And it was all, yeah. And um, so originally there was, um, there was an uprising in, in, I can't remember where it was. I think it was in South Dakota. Um, And anyways, there was some braves that broke out of a reservation and started pillaging some, you know, colonial settler villages. And, um, and, and, and the government originally wanted to sentence 300, like they wanted to hang 300 of these men mm-hmm. um, when there was only maybe 20 involved. Um, but instead of hanging the 300, Abraham Lincoln um, reduced it to 38. But what he ended up doing is he went in, like they, he personally uh, picked the, the war chiefs, you know, he, per, he picked the medicine men, the knowledge <sighs> keepers, the elders, the, um, you know, the teachers, the, the, the staples to the, the community. And all 38 men that they hung held some major importance to the tribe. Sure. And, um, and, and so it was a very calculated, you know, uh, power move to show, <laughs> just completely yeah. cripple, sure. you know, them. And, um, and so anyways, fast forward a couple years later, you have um, in, in the Black Hills, South Dakota, mm-hmm. you have the six grandfathers. So the Black Hills are a very sacred mountain site okay. to the Sioux people, and the six grandfathers is actually was actually one of their most sacred mountains. Mm. And um, and tribes from all over America would would pilgrimage to it to offer prayers and okay. and uh, and sacrifices and um, of tobacco, and. Um, and then the United States, when tourism started, you know, taking over um, the United States, the United States Tourism Board decided to designate the six grandfathers for Mount Rushmore. Mm. And as Mount Rushmore is, you know, the president's, uh, the, the faces of the president's, yes, yes. right? And so not only is it the faces of the president's, it's the face of Abraham Lincoln, who committed, you know, one of the worst, you know, atrocities to their leaders of the tribe. So it, um, it was an, it's very much an insult to injury right they said we can kill your people we can kill your leaders and we can take your sacred hills and we can blast our colonial you know faces on it as a reminder it's a reminder sure it's not like you you know you you, people would say oh ignorance right but like that is so calculated and of course those black hills are super close to the pine ridge indian reservation right they're super close to so many different ones right as just a constant reminder of the power right of who's in power who's in control sure um this is what we can do and this is what we will do that's kind of what they're saying and so Obviously, this TP at the RCMP headquarters, right, is, is very much on a smaller scale, but, you know, it's a, it's a power move. Hmm. And it's, you know, it's the colonial construct saying, this is what we did, this is what we can do, and this is what we will do. And they do. <laughs> yeah. If that, yeah. No, that's, that's incredible. Again, mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And I, I, did yeah. a, I did an episode of this show a few mm-hmm. weeks ago with a, with a girl who has Chinese heritage, mm-hmm. and she was t- telling me some of the stuff about how the Chinese immigrants were treated, br- brought oh, into this country. Brutal. And I just... I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. It wasn't even that I... I no, just, you just were never taught. You just were never yeah. taught. And yeah. that, I think, was where we were before we, we stopped. It was... I didn't learn about residential schools in when I was going to Edmonton mm-hmm. Public Schools. Yeah, same. I same. was in first-year university. I read a novel called Kiss of the Fur Queen by okay, Thompson yeah. Highway. Yeah, yeah, Great book. Yeah. Anybody should read that yeah. book. And that was like, oh... That was it wasn't weird. It wasn't just like we traded and things were good. It was like, no, we actually raped the kids, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, is there a problem there? Obviously, it's a problem no, there. No. But is there a problem there with the the school system? Yes, w- and that's why, it. It's, it's whitewashed. It's, yeah, it's yeah, it's um, 
we need to learn the history as the indigenous people experienced it. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn the history from the indigenous people because they're the only ones who know the truth, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they will, like, the, the true history is not taught in the classrooms. Um, for example, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't remember learning about residential schools in, in school. Um, but what I remember, what I did learn about was um, there was a a Beothuk woman. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna butcher her name. That's all right. It's I, I think it's Shanna Shanna Wadithit. She was the uh, the last of the Beothuk woman, mm. or the last of the Beothuk people. Um, and so I learned that like we and she, and this woman, uh, this Beothuk woman, she helped some explorers in Newfoundland chart a passage somewhere, and this is why she was famous. This is kind of why we were uh, taught about her. Okay, um, was because for she what she for her. what she did for Canada, right? Right. Um, but I just remember in my textbook, right? I'm reading this, and you know, she, um, this woman, the last of the Beothuk people, and then you know, and then a massive page of all of this stuff she did for the colonizers. And then, you know, I go back to it and I'm reading that first sentence. I'm like, mm. the last of the Beothuk people. I'm like, wait a second. Yeah. Like, why, wait, where did, where's the rest of them? <laughs> and you, you know, you start asking those questions. Yeah. You're like, where did the rest of them go? And then I find out later, you know, after more research that um, the Beothuk people were hunted to extinction. Uh, the colonists in Newfoundland, they would go to church in the morning and then they would hunt the Beothuk in the afternoon. Jesus. And then feast in the evening. <laughs> and, and that was a Sunday. That was, and, and to this day, if you, yeah, the Beothuk are extinct. Um, because, of, of course, a, lot, a, a major, uh, a majority of them were taken out by, you know, the, the diseases as well. Right. But, this, but that was just like, that was just cultural common practice uh, at the time. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, but we didn't learn about that. We no. learned about this woman the, and, and, what she, and how the government used her, sure. basically. And as soon as her role was done, as soon as she had, you know, fulfilled her role as a guide, mm -hmm. gone. You know, just well, like I think, yeah. Surely. Yeah, she, I don't, I can't remember what happened to her. But, Isn't uh, that crazy? The last, yeah. Yeah. And do you think she did that work by choice? Absolutely it was not. Probably like, Absolutely you could not. do this. Yeah, and they portrayed her in the book as you know a very loving, kind, helping woman. You know mm -hmm. who helped the who helped the white man. You right. know, and, and and did it out of the kindness and goodness of her heart. When I'm sure she had a chain around her foot. You know. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was in Lake Louise this just last month, and we we did a hike from from the lake up mm -hmm. to first Mirror Lake, and then Lake Agnes. And Lake Agnes yeah. is so named after Sir John A. Macdonald's second wife. Right. And I found myself thinking. That's not the name of that lake. No, you know, absolutely I, not. You know? No, no, you know, yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. But that's a whole part of the the way that it, the colonization works, mm -hmm. right? It's it's mm -hmm. it's physical on the mm -hmm. land with mm -hmm. the people, but it's also yeah. uh, uh, it's on every level, yeah. religious, yeah. spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. It rewrites. It does. It erases. Yeah. And 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 yeah, there's so much deep history behind those things, and even just like thinking about like names of things. Um, like the mount, like mountain peaks. So there was a mountain peak outside of Canmore. It's called Squaw's Tit. Oh, good. And like you know, Squaw is a very, very, very derogative term for an indigenous woman. And um, yeah. yeah, and there was literally a mountain peak up until I think there was a petition. Jesus. Maybe it changed. Um, but also, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ha Ling Peak. Yes. So Ha Ling Peak used to be called um, uh, like Chinaman Peak. Oh, good. Yeah. And so again, just like. And that was, and the name change didn't change like 20 years ago. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And so, yeah, there's so many, and, uh, you know, I just Google, like, um, I type into Google Maps sometimes, like, like, like Dead Indian. Oh. And then Dead oh, Indian God. Road, Dead Indian Lake, Dead Indian Park, you know, all of these things. And, How is that uh, still allowed? Right? And you could type in any sort of, uh, basically, indigenous slur into Google Maps, and you're going to find... That, like there's so many places like names yeah, I hadn't even thought about yeah, that after like, those things, yeah so I mean it just goes on and on and on and on, on. and yeah. it, it almost seemingly never stops no the, the depths now what do you how do you how would you deal with the idea that we say well it's easy to look back on two three hundred years mm -hmm. and, and, and condemn those actions yeah is there any and I'm not asking for anybody ever to sympathize with those actions mm -hmm. but is there a way in which this the I guess how can how can we possibly reconcile that kind of violence and those atrocities? How could we ever? Is it even possible? Um, 
So I'm not sure th if you're familiar with like the true the Truth and Reconciliation yes. Commission. Yes. You know that kind of went through. Oh, I can't remember the last year. It was like Stephen Harper's big apology. Right. Right. And Up then to about 2015. 2015. Yeah. Um, but when the they had the big conferences in each mm -hmm. major city in mm -hmm. in like throughout Canada, and it ended in Edmonton. Actually, I think that was back in. Interesting. 2012, okay. I believe. Um, and they had panels and, and speakers and okay. survivors and apologies, right? right? It was right. like this big thing. Right. Um, that's actually funny because as soon as that was over, they kind of just like wiped their hands. Yeah. And well, like, okay, we're done. We're good, right? We're good, right? Like, you guys chill. <laughs> um, but in reality, they there was uh, recommendations, um, yeah. the TRC recommendations. About and there's, 90 and there's, of them. Yeah, there's quite a few recommendations. And um, I think of, of all of them, they, re they only implemented around 10, yeah. I believe, yeah. compared to the rest. And one of those recommendations originally was, um, like, check residential school sites for oh, remains and, and bodies. And, and sure enough, right here we are 10 years, almost 10 years later, right? And they're finally getting around, um, getting to, around to it, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Um, and so those, I, I highly recommend anybody listening to this mm -hmm. to go and read every single one of those recommendations because they offer a lot of insight mm -hmm. and a lot of wisdom and they were all drafted by like an indigenous council interesting right and um, and how it's basically just um, indigenous people um, teaching others how they want to be okay you know, treated and in your in your mind yeah. and it, with your knowledge of that is it is it fair is uh, those um, recommendations? Yes, yes, I, yeah. The, 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 a lot of, it's actually funny. A lot of the recommendations are the bare minimum, oh, okay. right? <laughs> so, I mean, if we can get them to implement them to a small degree, mm -hmm. right, there's a lot of wiggle room and, you know, there's a lot of room. There's obviously room for improvement. Sure. And there will always be room for improvement. So, yes, I feel like it's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, and another, again, another way is education reform, you know. Um, like if... if uh, if indigenous, they, they, you know, they say, well, the, like the horrors of the schools are, mm -hmm. you know, are too bad to, like, you know, too scary for, like, you know, children to teach children, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I agree, of course, to a certain age, but, um, you know, it's like if, if indigenous children, um, <laughs> sure. you know, they, they, they weren't too young to experience those horrors, right? It's like, why Seemingly can't not. other, why can't, you know, <laughs> white kids learn about them, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and I feel, yeah. The education system really needs to um, to be changed, and, um, and and indigenous like indigenous people speaking on behalf of indigenous people. Right now, you have yes. so many white people in places of power, mm. like even just like Indian affairs. Right, the fact that that still exists even is just that. like. Oh, such a oh my God. affairs. Yeah, Those are just some affairs. Yeah, we're exactly. After. Yeah, and you have a head of Indian affairs, and guess who? <laughs> they're white. You know, yep. and um, and and then you have in schools, you know, um, indigenous cultural, uh, like, teachers, and you know, and they're white, and you see uh, professors who you know, and again, like I'm not saying that um, they're bad or like that they're not like they don't know what they're talking about, but mm. we need indigenous representation in education. And we need indigenous representation mm -hmm. in politics. Mm -hmm. um, we need, yeah, just, we are, like, indigenous people are the most visible and invisible people in mm -hmm. this country. We're visible when we fit a, um, an agenda, like sure. indigenous day, you know, we've, or, or, or orange shirt day, yeah. you know, um, but we're invisible every other day of the year. You know, right. they, 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 they use us as props. They, mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and for example, I just want to talk about like sure. um, in Banff, um, the the original tribe that was uh, that was inhab that inhabited the area around Banff, um, they were originally removed from their territory uh, to the to the lower hills, and I um, mean it was illegal for them to go back onto oh. their to because they had trap lines and you know and mm -hmm. they had their fishing spots and and all of their other spots, and so yeah they were for 50 years they weren't allowed to go back um, into Banff except for 10 days. Ten days out of the year, they were allowed to visit Banff, and those ten days were called Indian Days, oh, good. and it was a it was a festival put on by the by the government by the municipal government, and they brought all the indigenous people from the tribe in there for ten days of the year. Legally, they were allowed to be there to dance and to 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 give their regalia and to give their beads and to sing their songs, and then and then outside of those ten years, 
at, early on, I'm sure it could have mm-hmm. been punishable by death at sure. the time. Surely it right? was, right? Yeah, and so just to think about that, mm-hmm. you know, um, just really shows you how, like, how, how the government treats us and how the government truly, truly, truly views Indigenous people, right? right? We don't want any more kind words. We don't want any more, sure. you know, meetings about reconciliation. You know, we don't want thoughts and prayers, right? We want policy. We want action, mm-hmm. you know? We want sure. substantial change, and we need it now because, yeah, people are, like, people are actively dying. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I, could, I mean, I obviously could not have said it better. So thank, <laughs> thank you, you for saying yeah, that. You're welcome. Um, you're welcome. Uh, that, you brought up an interesting point about uh, sort of tokenizing or using you as props. I wanted to ask you, because it's right on the sort of the, the forefront today in Edmonton with, with the Edmonton Eskimos changing their name to mm-hmm. the Elks. Yeah. And I'm not asking you to speak for anybody right. other than yourself, but right. I've heard multiple takes on this. And I'm mm-hmm. wondering, is, is it maybe just time that we shouldn't have sports teams named after Aboriginal tribes, period? Mm-hmm. Is that just fair to say? Absolutely. There's no, flat out. Flat out. And there's no, yeah, there's no... There's no, there's, it's black and white. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's cool. Yeah. I, now I have heard, like you would not name your team something that was weak and derogatory. Like it was at the time. Not, and I'm not. Again, I'm not yeah. fighting you yeah. here. No. But it was not done from a place of being derogatory. But I guess it was seeing natives or as, my apologies, indigenous as mm-hmm. being something less than something that mm-hmm. could be a mascot that could right. represent something. Right. Right. Exactly. Something not human. Sure. Right. Yes. Big and powerful and strong, sure. but not human, mm-hmm. right? You think about dragons, mm-hmm. you know, you think about gladiators, mm-hmm. or I guess gladiators are human, anyways. That's not Giants, a maybe? Giants, eagles. yeah, yeah, eagles. You think about all of these fantastic, like these fantasy creatures, right, sure. that we see for team names and stuff, and, and it's like, yeah, indigenous people were just seen as, just as, as not human, and it's, um, and a very good example of this is like the Washington Redskins. Um, by the Washington Redskins being named that there is, like that, that they were, I guess they changed it now. But um, there's a very there's a picture um, on the internet of uh, I think it's a Jaguars fan. Mm. The Jaguars were playing the Redskins, okay. and uh, and the Jaguars fan has like a like a fake sword in his hand, and the head of a dead chief is is impaled on it. And, uh, you know, and, and he's just standing there, right. his paper mache dead chief head, just screaming his head off at this game, you know, and no one's batting an eye. Right. Right. And so by, yeah, by minimizing indigenous people to a mascot allows, you know, people to, to do that. For okay. Example. Well said. Yeah. Well said. It, yeah. it does dehumanize. It does. You know? yeah. 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 But no, I totally understand some of the, some of the names were given to the to the sports teams right because again like you wouldn't yeah you wouldn't want to name your team name something weak and inferior i guess to some degree they thought they were respecting them but also you have to think about how um indigenous names everywhere you have to think about like when you when i say apache Mm -hmm. you know most people think of a helicopter you know and 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 that's not fair to the apache people right you know what i mean when i say dakota Mm -hmm. you know think of the state the state yeah. The vehicle, you know. Sure. Yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and and that's not fair to the to the, to those people, right? I, and there's so many names like that mm. where they have just completely lost their indigenous meanings, mm. right? They're just a, they're an object. They're a car. They're a vacuum. You know what I mean? They're all these things, but they're not indigenous. And so not so not, we're not just talking about mascots. We're talking about native names across the board. Right. Right. Yep. And um, yeah. And again, it's it's. Of course, we're not going to, like, fight forward to, like, change, you know, or, like, that's kind of, um, but at the same time, yeah, just, uh, like, the mascot thing is, there is potential for change there, as we see sure. now, and it's been actually super exciting to see the Eskimos, you know, change oh. their name, and, and to see, like, the Redskins, and now to see all of these other teams kind of also follow suit. Right. Well, yeah. Redskins is pretty unforgivable. Yeah. Oh, you know, absolutely. That's terrible. You know, when you think about, the, like, the Cleveland Indians, you know, and it's a lot of these also. sports teams that have those indigenous names and mascots they you know like there's like the, the tomahawk chop yes um, the atlanta braves the, yeah the atlanta yeah. braves right and uh, the tomahawk like and the, the chant or whatever that they use is actually like a there's, it's a, there's an indigenous tribe somewhere in the states that's actually one of their songs it's actually one of their like powwow songs one of their ceremonial songs and they've just you know doing that chop doing it during a game and it's you know yeah so there's, it's yeah there's just uh when you when you see something that less than human or not is human, it's so easy to just completely you know bastardize right. 
everything. Maybe it is part yeah. of that colonial move then to just yeah yeah yes you're still in invi- yes you're still visible, visible in the culture but yeah. you're as a sort of sideshow that we entertain ourselves yeah. with. Yeah, exactly. We throw money at right, right. Yeah. So yeah. you said this before, but actionable policy and, mm-hmm. and real change. What mm-hmm. what is there a certain? I guess what I'm curious because your boots on the ground, you're you're mm-hmm. with the homeless, you're with mm-hmm. a lot of the indigenous community. Mm-hmm. What is the sort of you know, because I, I'm guilty of this, is mm-hmm. when I, I don't have a ton of interaction with them. Mm-hmm. But when I do, I'm always struck by the humanity. It's like, that's that's life right there. And mm-hmm. I just, for mm-hmm. whatever, I've been sheltered my life. Mm-hmm. I've tried to mm-hmm. reach out in some ways. Mm-hmm. This is part of that. But mm-hmm. what is kind of the pervade, pervading sort of, or do they even have time to think about themselves culturally, about themselves in the municipal framework or is it just like just survival um i would say for a majority of them it's crisis mode okay um 24 7 um it's really cool like at the bissell center we have um cultural supports available okay. for um uh, for the indigenous people in our community um and so there's also just kind of like um an, like a like ap- a very apathetic uh. right um, and I find this sometimes even like an in indigenous youth mm-hmm. um, and, and like in learning the language even and keeping the language alive, there's sometimes this general attitude of apathy where it's like, it, it's, uh, it's, it's like, well, English is so much easier, mm-hmm. right? It's like, why? And I was there. I was also guilty of this sure. at one point where I was like, well, why would I learn? Why would I want to learn like a dying language? You know, why, why would I take the time to right. do that, right? But that was back when I didn't understand how important the language is like if the language dies the people die mm-hmm. right and 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 the language is 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 everything and then um and so it's just trying to like get people get indigenous people uh, to get them or like just trying to help them understand mm-hmm. that the importance of it and um and the importance of of, of holding on to it and then teaching the next generations that, right? Because, um, yeah, just at the rate it's going now, mm-hmm. yeah, like there's still, like, I think it's like almost every day, you know, like an indigenous language dies out. Wow. And, um, and it's like, what can we do, what? you know? Yeah. Right. And, and I feel like, yeah, even just like back to education, teaching Cree across the board, mm-hmm. you know, making it, making it mandatory to graduate high school with at least one credit in a Cree language course and one credit in a Cree history course. Sure. You know what I mean? Um, it's really cool in New Zealand. Um, I spent a year there uh, okay. working at a summer camp and New Zealand is very, is very much steps ahead of Canada when it comes to indigenous uh, oh. like representation and, and, um, and policies. Okay. Of course, they're a lot smaller and so it's yes. a lot easier for them to do it. And of course, the Maori tribe, they're, um, they're just one tribe mm. versus here, right? You have the Cree, the Blackfoot. Yeah, so many. Um, so it's kind of hard to like transfer a lot of what they're doing on such a big scale. But um, like, for example, yeah, like a lot of, um, like everything in New Zealand is, it has the traditional Maori name. Hmm. And um, of course you have like the big cities, Wellington, Christchurch, and you'll have some of the colonial names spliced in there, but like mm. every random road, every mm. random port, you know, has the, uh, yeah, has the Maori name. And, um, and the country as a whole, like um, they call the white people there Pakiha. Hmm. Um, so this is cool. Pakiha in Maori is white turnip. So <laughs> the Maori didn't have a langu- didn't have a word for white That's when funny. the colonizers first came. Okay. So they called them the closest thing that they <laughs> could see, uh, and it was a turnip. And so they called them Pakiha. And so to this day, the white people in New Zealand still refer to themselves as Pakiha, and the Maori have embraced Pakiha as Maori. So, for uh-huh. example, here in Canada, like, I say we're all treaty people. You mm-hmm. know, the white people and the indigenous people, we both sign the treaties, right? That Tr- makes true. us both. That makes us both treaty people, makes us both on the same level. And that's kind of what the Maori have done in New Zealand, is they've taken the Pakiha and they've kind of embraced them as their own. Right. And, um, and it's really cool because, obviously, like, they still have years of progress to go when it comes to, like, the treatments of Maori sure. there. But... Um, for the for the most part, every person I inter- every white person I interacted with there, they had a they had a de- like had a decent base knowledge of the language and a, and a really big, good base knowledge of of the culture, huh. right? And um, and that started that started years ago, right? That started years ago within their education system, where yeah, kids couldn't like I don't know if it's every school, but I know that yeah, the kids kids graduate 
consistently with Maori language courses and Maori cultural courses. And I feel like if we could implement mm. something like that here, right, it would just change. It would just change the fabric of the sure. of the nation, of the country. Yeah. Oh, well said. Yeah. And that's an interesting example mm. that I didn't know. Yeah. It's a sort of weaving. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not assimilation, but it's... No, it's a weaving. It's yeah. an interconnectedness, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think about it. Like, I think about what if things didn't go the way they did? You know, what if the colonizers allowed us to exist right. as sovereign nations, you know? Mm. Um, and, you know, I think about, like, how incredible would it be to just be biking through the River Valley and you see, you know, a Cree family and their, and their teepee and their fishing, you know, mm. on the side of the bank, just untouched, unbothered, you know, just sure. living their life. Like, how special you know, would that be? And, you know, obviously, maybe it wouldn't have looked exactly like that, but obviously it didn't have to no, go the way that it Quite as badly as it did. Right? Um, but, yeah, I feel like there's, I mean, you know, and you probably have heard this term land back. Sure. Right? And, um, and land back is my understanding of it. You know, there's a lot of indigenous people, right, saying it, and to them, it, you know, it means something different okay. um, to each their own. Um, which I think is also beautiful. Um, but I guess, yeah, for me, it's or the way I see it as is like, like um, indigenous, indigenous sovereignty over the land where, where indigenous people, if they were originally from that territory, they get the final say on what happens. Oh. Like they make the decisions on what happens to Mother Earth, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and they, and because I think it's like 80% 80, 80 I can't remember the statistics, but like whatever's left of the world's natural biodiversity, right. um, I think like 80% of it is protected by indigenous people. Something cr like something cr uh, like crazy like that. Really? Um, so you're still doing the work. Yeah. You're still doing the like yeah, the land still stewardship. Yeah. 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 And and if you think about it, like you think about all of the you know the tree huggers and the and, and the <laughs> activists that you see, you know, like like there's usually. Like, it's usually led, you know, by indigenous people. Mm -hmm. um, and even just here in, in Canada, like, uh, like Wet'suwet'en, in, in, like, the Great Bear Rainforest, like, north, oh, like, like northwestern BC, north BC okay. right? Um, you have land protectors up there, and then you have um, the Tiny House Warriors. Mm. Um, and I, I think they're just outside of Kamloops. Um, and they're, you know, they're doing land protection there. And then you have Land Back Lane on the east. Uh, I think it's in Ontario. Okay. So, yeah, you have, you have these indigenous groups actively doing the work still. And, and even just thinking about, like, the Amazon and thinking about sure. the Amazonian tribes, right, that yeah. are actively fighting, lo like, literally, you know, life and death for some of them, you know, fighting loggers in that jungle, you know. And so, yeah, we're, we're still, we still know how important it is, right, and we haven't stopped fighting for the earth right mm. um because yeah. that transcends yeah. that transcends yeah. whatever yeah. Right? It's, it's yeah. like it's our it's it's within our very beings yes. you know to, yeah. to do that you know well, yeah. that's interesting i i, yeah. I suppose so maybe you can help me understand the whole the treaty concept mm -hmm. w was that part of the the reservation system yeah so basically the treaties from my understanding again like i'm not like I, i'm not the expert no it's okay. right but um they they were uh, they were written for, again, they were written for equal sides to mm. partake, Okay. right? And the, the indig and a lot of the treaties, the indigenous people had, had verbally and, and, and um, expressed mm. their demand, like, you know, what they wanted and what they needed to be taken care of. Okay. And, um, and of course, <laughs> every single one of those things were violated and none of them came into fruition. <laughs> um, and even like a lot of the treaties required a certain majority of votes and signatures from the indigenous leaders. Okay. And, um, and I would say almost all of the treaties were pushed ahead with, with, with even a quarter of the vote, with a quarter of the signatures. Right. Um, some... Uh, some a lot of tr a lot of chiefs were were coerced. Um, sure. A lot of chiefs were threatened. Mm -hmm. A lot of chiefs were. Um, they would come and they would get them drunk, and they would put a pen in their hand and they would you know just get just get something them. you know. And this is an, an, an any sort of way you mm -hmm. know to trick them, <laughs> sure. and on, on all ends, yeah. And so again, yeah, the treaty again, in theory, is 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 two equal sides coming together in a partnership. Right. But from the start, it was never going to be that way. Right. I, I find that. Yeah. I, honestly, I think a lot of that comes from a Christian influence where mm -hmm. it's like there's some ordained truth and we're just bringing it to you. Yeah. But it's like. Yeah. 
we were here. Yeah. And now suddenly you're here telling me there's laws and I yeah. can go here and can't go here and I'm going to yeah. sign like. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean that's a whole. Whole side of thing. things right yeah. i was i took a cruise through the wikipedia page for the for residential mm-hmm. schools in canada mm-hmm. and uh you know that was that ruined my night <laughs> you know but <laughs> oh absolutely you know yeah it's heavy but i didn't even know that they were administered by the church most of them by the catholic and the united yeah. church yeah united church has since apologized more yes or less. yeah the, yeah the united church has definitely taken a lot of steps for towards reconciliation versus the catholic church which has basically done nothing seems to refuse to oh absolutely yeah and um it's actually super interesting i found a news article from a kamloops newspaper 2008 i think it was okay and uh there was a guy for about 10 10 years trying to tell the the church in the area that you know the bodies are there and they have word wow. they have they have they have physical proof they have eyewitness proof they have all of this stuff um and uh, this article was called oh what was it burials or bogus Oh right, and basically, right. it was this. The, the article was basically just talking about how these Catholic leaders, these church ministers, just they just gaslit the hell out of this guy, <laughs> and they said, um, you know, the, the church ministers were asked about this gentleman, and they said, oh yeah, he he's starting to get on our nerves. You know, this is what they were quoted saying, and uh, right. you know, he's been on our back for ten years now, and you know, like it's getting a bit ridiculous, and and now looking looking at what we just discovered, right, like last week. I'm just like the audacity, sure, right, uh, to do that, and and they know, they know, right, right, and it's I think yeah, again, like the truth is finally coming out. Um, but that kind of evil is is inconceivable on some level, isn't it? Yes. Like how can how yeah. can we? Yeah, I, and I, yeah, I honestly, yeah, white white supremacy, mm-hmm. you know, is is the biggest threat to people of color in this world today. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think it's it's it, and it's the biggest yeah, and, and we see it f- what, five days ago when that Muslim family oh yeah you know was run down by a white supremacist terrorist and and it's like we just see it happen and it happens and it makes the headlines and then it just kind of gets pushed back you know what I mean and mm-hmm. uh, and that's like yeah white supremacy it thrives on that it thrives on being forgotten about it mm. thrives on people not talking about it it thrives on people not discussing it um, and it exists on so many levels mm-hmm. in today's society and um, yeah and it's just a matter of confronting it you know on every yep. level and I'm talking about um, microaggressions from sure. from from uh, from like bank tellers you know Mm. i'm talking about security guards who follow me through the mall you know like just little things and not being you know like combative or conflictive about it but just like being hey Mm -hmm. that's not right this isn't not this isn't right and um and yeah if that yeah no i think Mm -hmm. that's that's it's i get sucked into those things because a i can't really Mm -hmm. uh conceive of it like i should tell you um Going back to my great grandmother, she was she was native. She mm-hmm. was part of the Diné tribe, yeah. and so my my grandmother then is Métis. Yeah. But I, I'm I was not raised in that culture. Okay. Have I benefited from colonialism mm-hmm. all the way? Yeah. Have I suffered because of my native heritage or my indigenous heritage? Mm-hmm. Not at all. Yeah. But just so you're clear, it's something that I growing up within white culture, mm-hmm. there was so much racism mm-hmm. and so much just assumed about indigenous mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Whatever, mm-hmm. drunk, lazy, you yeah. name it. You've probably yeah. heard it all. Yeah. To me, there was always something inside me that just told me that it wasn't right, mm-hmm. you know, but there was n- really nowhere to turn. Right. You know? Yeah. You don't have the, um, I mean, it's, it's not, like, to go against the grain sure. in those situations is the last thing. As a human being, as a, as, a, as, a, like a, as a human being who, you know, um, fears rejection, right. you know, a human being who's, um, you know, so fragile in sure. when it comes to, you know, being accepted, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally understand because I was very much, as an Indigenous person, um, I get, you, uh, we call it uh, lateral violence, hmm. um, which is basically being racist towards your own your own kind. Oh. And so as, so in, um, yeah, I used to, I used to be the cool native kid because I tolerated all of the, the, the Indian jokes oh. and my white friends would be like, Oh yeah. Like you're so cool because you know, you like you, you're okay with this and you yeah. laugh at these. And of course, you know, I just, it was just like, a it was just like, a 
a defense mechanism, sure. right? That was safe. Yep. So that's what I did. And I would, I would make fun of the, like, when I went to Iron River School to, to high school in town and moving into the big high school, right? Mm -hmm. We had kids come off reservation. And I remember I was told by some of my white friends that, like, oh, watch out for those res kids, like those res rats. They called res them, rats. like, don't hang out with them. Right. Like, they're bad news. They'll, you know, like those Indians, those dirty Indians. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Im now I look back and I'm like, do you know who you were talking to, yeah. right? An, an Indian. An Indian, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but, but of course, in that moment, yeah, no, of course, yeah. And so I, I would make fun of them. I would make jokes. I'd throw slurs at them. Being, being. And that's that kind of internalized colonized. Right? Where now yeah, exactly. I was, yeah, uh, yeah. I was, I, I was benefiting from it, right? I benefited from white privilege, right? Having, you know, my dad have a stable job and, you know, high status in the community, okay. right? And, um, and, and, you know, and I look back. And that's how my life was able to go one way, right? Right, and how my friend's life completely dropped went and went the opposite way, right? I benefited from colonial constructs, sure, and uh, and I had so many more opportunities than a lot of these kids uh, would have had, based on you know mm -hmm. um, being middle class, you know, right? Yes, yeah. right. I, I did want yeah. to ask you that. Yeah. You, you painted that picture mm -hmm. of being in the shelter and mm -hmm. having someone you know ask you years later, "Well, how mm -hmm. did you get out yeah. of it?" And he, yeah, is that the answer? Then you had a two parent. Yeah, I had two parents that loved each other. Two stable jobs, a home, a stable home. You know. Yeah. Um, got to go to school every day. You know. Right. Was able to afford school supplies. You know what I mean? Like right. just Yeah, and just uh, I grew up very evangelical Christian oh, as well. Right. So had the you know the supports of the like the church also. I'm not a Christian anymore. No. Um, have been deconstructed for like three years now. Deconstructed. Um, deconstructed. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, but the but it was definitely yeah. But that I the, that definitely played a part. In, sure. Yeah. Which is kind of yeah. what the church. Ought to do exactly you know? so much potential, so, <laughs> so much, much potential. potential. To, good idea, right? Yeah, yeah, to do that and to do good. Yeah, um, and yeah. Anyways, that's like yeah, a whole nother no. Well, we can another topic. Well, yeah. it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, to me, so that's interesting. Hey, is yeah. that is that you? Because and I don't know a ton about it, but similar mm -hmm. to the African American experience in the United States, there's a dissolution, a dissolving of the family. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's in some. That's what's killing, in some ways, that culture. That's where that yeah. culture is failing. Do, is, do you see similar in the indigenous, where the, the family is breaking apart? Um, pardon me. Like, sorry. Yeah, this is afraid? a this yeah. is a half baked yeah. idea that yeah. I'm coming out. Okay, you with. that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, if you could just. My understanding is that uh, African American families in the United States, it's an over representation of like single family. Right, living. Right, you know, yeah, like, it's like just, yeah, it's single parent homes. Yes, yeah. Yeah. and we know mm -hmm. we know that that just does not benefit mm -hmm. the children. So, some, like, I, uh, generally, yeah. I just kind of want to catch you there just for a second. Yeah, please, but, do. Um, please do. There's the, the government, and they like to demonize single parent homes. Okay, right. Um, for example, like when we talk about children in care, like for indi like indigenous ch children representing, uh, over representing care, um, like we we say that like you know social ser like children family services are is they're still actively taking ki native kids right sure. from their homes. Oh man, um, and it's like, and it's like because they're de you know they they demonize the family for not being good or for having addictions or, you know, for sure. living in poverty. Sure, sure. But it's like, what if all of that money we're giving to this foster home or all of this money we're giving to this, 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 this group home, mm -hmm. it's like, what if we funneled that into a structure that could benefit the parent mm -hmm. and get, you know, and so I know like, um, sure. yeah, yeah, so like sometimes some, like there's a lot of single moms out there mm -hmm. and they are just, they are like, they are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. like they're doing so well and, and doing so well for their child. And so when they talk about like, like so a lot, like a lot of, yeah, they like to portray these single parent homes as being broken and being shattered and, oh, that, that, that kid needs a man's influence or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but when reality the kid is okay. The mom is okay. They're doing okay. Sure. But by just by having a single parent home, they're they're already labeled as you know as broken or as you sure. Know. Um, but I feel like yeah, like if that yeah, if that like it's like why don't we just take that money and 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 put it into the mom and put it into the mother? You know what I mean? And and get her on her feet where sure. she can because the kid will one hundred percent always be better off. Right in their culture with their parents, yes, you know, and so yeah, if oh, that kind of helps. No, that thanks for clearing that yeah. up because then it yeah. got me thinking that maybe the nuclear family is a colonial concept. Oh, hundred percent, right? Like hundred <laughs> percent, yeah, exactly. Who said that was you know the the right. the, the, the 
the cut and dry or whatever. Sure. But yeah. So end. I guess mm-hmm. to, to continue on mm-hmm. that thread then, but yeah. do you still see then, okay, a, a culture or a, a family on whatever level, a breakdown where the, where then the children just don't have the support that they need. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, is that? Yeah. Well, the thing is, is the kids don't have the supports that they need because the parents don't have the supports that they need, right? right? Um, you know, you have like thousands and thousands of you know residential school survivors, mm-hmm. right? I don't think you don't. You'll never meet an indigenous person who's not in touch by some sort of you know intergenerational trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, the kids and will ne- like the, the kids never have the supports is because the parents don't, and um, and then the parents are demonized. They're right. bad parents, you know. They're like they, they, they don't deserve those kids. And it's like in reality, it's like it's a uh, it's a cycle you know yes. yeah and i know like even on the street i know three generations of homeless people wow yeah they like, live together they, they 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 stay at the shelter there's there's grandfather son and wow. there's or grandfather dad father and son you know sometimes i'm like all in the same all, like side by like all three in a row three generations lost that's and uh hard to take. yeah yeah and so when we talk about you know the failings where, where yeah, kids don't have the proper resources, it's like, well, they're just products of their right. environments. They're products of their upbringings. Yeah. How could they ever be expect, expected? Expected. To, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They've they never were born, even seen yeah, what it would look like. Born two steps back. Right. Yeah. Now, that's... Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, I, every time I get into this, I learn something else mm-hmm. that just is shattering, yeah. you know? Yeah, actually, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not, uh, it's, not a, it's not sunshine. It's not, it's really <laughs> not. rainbows. No, it's really not. Now... No. What, in your experience, is kind of the chief or leading causes of, of homelessness? It, and you can keep, you can take that however you want. But what, what is there sort of some, some things we're seeing there, just you know, blanket? In some um, ways? like just mental health. Yeah. Yeah, I would say seven upwards to seventy percent of Edmonton's homeless people have mental health issues. That right. was like a statistic from this was back in like twenty thirteen. Okay. Um, back when I like really studied them. But um, I would say, yeah, mental health resources for sure. And then just addictions Mm -hmm. um, also play a huge role in that. Um, And it's basically like, I'm a firm believer in like harm reduction. Okay. Right. Um, Which is uh, like, if someone's going to use drugs, they're going to use drugs. Right. And um, like, they might as well be safe using them. Um, so like the, the, the safe injection, mm-hmm. safe injection sites, we, you know, offer, uh, community members like a plate, like clean needles, you know, paramedics on yes. staff, nurses readily available. Cause like, if that's not there for them, they're just going to go do it in an alley and you with some, God knows what, yeah, with God knows what needle they found on the ground and, you know, and do, th- and, and, you know, potentially overdose and die where no one's going to see them. And, you know, people, and people will see that, say that, see that and be like, oh, well, they shouldn't use drugs then. Right. Right. And it's like, okay, if it only, if it only, it what was that easy. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so, yeah. And it's just like a matter of, um, meeting people where they're at and addressing hmm. their needs as like individually. Yes. Right. Yep. And, um, and, 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 you know, the, Rehab is nice, yes, and like, and, and detoxing is nice, and getting clean is nice. But it's like, it's so much easier said than done. Yeah. And and to go with like a very much like rehab, like, like Edmonton is kind of pushing for that, where they're shutting down the safe injection sites, and they're you know, and yes, again, like I'm not saying anything bad about rehab, but it's like the only person that's going to make the choice to change is themselves, yes. right? And and sadly, I can even say for some of these people is they'll never get help. They'll never get 100%. better, right? Um, but let's 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 put them in a spot where they're going to be loved the rest of their life. You know, let's you know let's right. let's put them in a place where they have some dignity. You know, yes. let's put them in a place where they can be happy, right? While still addressing you know their traumas and you know and still like allowing them to you know partake in whatever substances, right? But like there is a way to do it. Um, and yeah, I feel like yeah, the biggest causes and impacts to, to homelessness in the city are yeah, addictions and, and mental, mental health. health. Yeah, and we and so much of what we know about that is that those stem from trauma. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and again, yeah, nobody just wakes up in the morning. Sorry, yeah, nobody just wakes up in the morning and it's just like <laughs> I'm going to do crystal meth for the next 20 years of my life. Right. Right. Yeah. Every single one of these people, they have a story. Mm-hmm. Every single one of these people, something has happened to them that's set in a chain of events, mm-hmm. a, a chain, like a, a, a set in motion you know, something, um, that, you know, led them to where they are today. Right. And, um, and again, it's not a choice, right. They can't just choose to 
get clean and get a job, you know. So many people love to say that, you know, oh, this bum, you know, why don't you just get, you know, why don't you just like put some clean clothes on and, you know, go, go, go like it. Where the McDonald's. hell would I get changed? Exactly. There's so many things that would lead, like there's so many things stopping them from right. all of those things you want them to do. Right. And it's just a matter of like seeing all of those barriers mm-hmm. and, um, and trying to help them address each one. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I had a fascinating talk on this podcast a few weeks ago with, with, a, with a friend of mine who studies harm reduction okay. at UBC. Awesome. And yeah, yeah, I can pass that along. Yeah, I'm going to pass this along to her, actually. Okay. So yeah, Sweet. it's, Sweet. Uh, you know, yeah. I, and again, it's like, I, I'm guilty of coming in. I just, I hope I can just say I, I came in ignorant. No, of course. You know? No, I, I totally understand. And as you yeah. start thinking about safe supply mm-hmm. and, and supervised injection, it's like, it makes sense. right like uh, this is audio so people can't see but it's like right yeah duh duh right like duh. and okay let's if you will entertain me what then is the alternative to, to, how could you possibly oh my gosh the the alternative there is no alternative there's a lot of like i worked um like it was, it's, again a lot of recovery stuff is like religious Oh, right. Yes. Uh, you yeah, know what I mean? Steps. Yeah, the twelve steps and stuff, and that's not for like that doesn't work for everybody. You know what no. I mean? And so the like the alternative is it are those things. That's kind of what's only available, what's right. only accessible, right? Like you have Teen Challenge, you have um, you have a lot of these faith based recovery programs, okay. right? And so that's basically the alternative, and it always has been. You know, if you think about recovery, um, there's always some sort of religious... Even the notion of influence. rehabilitation, recovery, is yeah. a religious, yeah. uh, Christian yeah. notion. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's kind of the alternative, and that's no alternative. No. That's, <laughs> yeah. There, for some, doesn't. yes. Sure, absolutely. For some, yes. Yes, it does. But, but you have to, again, yeah, like want to take yeah, that. Yeah, stop forcing, you know, squ- uh, like, a, like a square peg into right. like a circle hole. Have you ever... Uh, yeah, exactly yeah, right. Yeah. And that's kind of what the whole thing has been. The mm-hmm. whole sort of post-colonial trying to whatever do whatever Mm -hmm. is is that square peg round hole Mm -hmm. yeah have you have you ever because you spend a lot of time with with folks that are homeless or Mm -hmm. you know high risk i guess yeah Um, vulnerable yeah yeah vulnerable Mm -hmm. have you ever had like some conversations with these people uh, with people Mm -hmm. not even these people just people right yeah (laughs) Yeah. those other people yeah yeah Yeah. 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 you know what i'm saying yeah um where, where you've where there's been some kind of clarity in them where they just say this is what happened to me this is what i want to do like Mm-hmm. Do you see some success stories oh, maybe? Well, absolutely. Yeah. Like um, working with this community for as long as I have, I've definitely seen both, okay. right? The success stories and the horror stories. Um, and it's always, and of course the horror stories more often. Okay. Um, but the good stories definitely outweigh them in the sense that, yeah, like I've had, yeah, I've had so many instances of, of people um, getting clean, mm. um, getting a job, getting housing, you know, becoming um, stable. And, um, and sometimes it doesn't even, like sometimes getting clean isn't uh, a part of that. Like okay. sometimes the people are still able to act, like um, they'll get into, um, there's like supported livings okay. or supported residences where they're, um, the substances are controlled. Right. Okay. And given out and distributed. Okay. Right. Um, while they can still lead, like again, it's all about just them. Per, it's all about personal, right, comfort and health and and happiness. Sure. And um, and so yeah, I've seen community members go the route of getting a job, getting their own place, and you know, doing that. And I've mm-hmm. also seen community members go into these like assisted living places, and um, you know, and, and of course, you know, there's there's the argument that you know. It's a very colonial argument where it's like, oh, well, those people aren't helping society. You know what I mean? Like, all people just need to help society well, and, you sure. know, and be productive members of society. And right. I was just like, um, yeah, it's just like a very colonial mindset. Interesting. And it's like, yeah. I've made that argument on this podcast, yeah. Yeah. but this way, yeah. it's more like, even if we, even if you did accept that, that was what mm-hmm. you wanted, but a productive society yeah. like that, yeah. why then wouldn't you want everybody to get healthy first? Exactly. And exactly. I, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody can help things in some way right but they just need to help them yeah they just need help themselves first you are no good to anybody if you're sick like that or or unhealthy or whatever yeah exactly yeah so no i've definitely seen um people get housed and it's actually quite cool because the bissell center um it's not a shelter 
So um, it's a drop in space. So mm-hmm. some of the some of the people that do use our space, they are housed, but that's where their community is, is in that space. Okay. Right. So it's cool. We get to see them housed off the street in a safe place, but then we they also get to like be with their friends, you know, be uh, with the people and, and which you and, need. And, yeah, which they need. You know what I mean? And so sometimes these housing programs, they'll like house a guy <laughs> like way northeast side, you know, and he's only like, and then of course like a week later he's back staying at He'd be you right. know at the shelter. Right, and, he's, and it doesn't make any sense. And, and to him, he's done nothing wrong. No. You know, he's like, "This is this is my home. These are my people. Why would you send me over there?" And even sometimes they don't even get they don't even get a bus. Pa- like sometimes even just like lack of uh, uh, huh. transportation. You know what I mean? Um, and, yeah. and yeah, so and the resources are there, um, but yeah, sometimes yeah, they just don't get taken care of huh. like the way they need to be. No, that's interesting mm-hmm. stuff, man. Yeah. And again, things that I hadn't thought about. It's like, yeah. yeah, get the guy some help. But it's like, well, shit, he's way... Yeah, exactly. You're yeah, <laughs> exactly. You're just isolating him. And <laughs> sure. if anything, going to make it worse. You're going to... you're gonna, He's going to do something potentially to the, the place, right? Sure. Or, um, yeah. He's bored? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Now, what yeah. has been... When you've seen these people get clean and they get housing or, mm-hmm. or they, they start to improve, what is... Is that that has to start within them, right? There has mm-hmm. to be that... I'm, I want to get better now. Absolutely. Yeah. It needs to be like, see, the thing is like, I, I learned v- v- at the very start of like working with this community. Um, I learned very early on that uh, I could, I could, I couldn't change anybody. I couldn't save anybody. Okay. Um, right. I couldn't save them. But what I can do is I can love them to a point where hmm. they see themselves needing. Um, Whoa. Uh, of help, and I'm not even, yeah, and not even, yeah, again, even just the word save, I don't really like to use sometimes because, like, there's like, have you ever heard of like white, the white savior, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but anyway, side note, um, no, it, help. Let's, yeah, let's just talk here. about, yeah, yeah, let's talk about help. And it's just like, yeah, I can, I can only love a person to the point where they, they need help. And I'm always going to be there for them to reach out. And sometimes, if not, that's also okay, hmm. right? Yeah, it's just it's just it's just a matter of being there for a person, consistently and showing up and supporting them and loving them and being like, I love you regardless if you change or not. But obviously, I would really like it if yeah, you did. Yeah, you know, right? Yeah, man, that's massive. What you just yeah. said there to love yeah. somebody enough that they could then maybe see in themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that is what yeah. is really lacking yeah. in this show, world. Yeah, show them they're valued. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all about self worth. How do you love other people, right? If you can't love yourself. How do you take care of other people if you can't? Yeah. Mm. How do you even take care of yourself self, if you don't yeah. love yourself? Right. Exactly. That. Yeah. That's. That's <laughs> what I was. We got there to together. Go for. <laughs> Thank you. All good. Yeah. All good. Yeah. yeah. And um, and that and that unconditional, no strings attached type of love is what people need. And yeah. yes, like a mother's love yeah. almost. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. No agenda. No agenda. No. Meet people where they're at. Like I, I go into these situations, I'm never, ever, ever trying to make them come up to where I am. Hmm. I'm always going to go in there and meet them where they are. And then from there, I can help them get out of it, you know, slowly and surely. And, and again, like some of these guys like, ah, I've known for like eight years and they're still homeless and, 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 and sometimes worse than they were before. But they're still alive. They're still kicking. They're right. still fighting. And, that's, and I applaud them for that, you know. And that's really all, yeah all we can do sometimes for sure and that's yeah. another thing too is not to pass a moral judgment on, oh, on exactly them, right? yeah that's man that's now it struck me when you were talking about that unconditional love mm-hmm. and mean mm-hmm. who then fills or do they not need someone to then bring in a little bit of what you might call tough love or this mm-hmm. sort of hey man like look at your situation or is it not even necessary it's like obviously i'm homeless yeah honestly when it comes to tough love i don't know it depends on the person or and or how they respond sure right to certain things because like i know there's some community members yeah where you know we have that type of relationship right where i can just tell them to like get their their shit together (laughs) and you know we can laugh about it okay um right but but um yeah i guess yeah it's it's uh it's it's like guess situational okay um but yeah for the most part yeah i i don't yeah, that, that, that concept of tough love. I believe, like, boundaries. Sure. Like, yeah, setting healthy boundaries, setting healthy boundaries, and, um, and just, um, and being, and being, like, 
I don't know, like stern with, or you know, just being like upfront, being real, frank, being yeah, frank, yeah. being real with people. I think yeah, is very real. important, and you know, and sometimes telling people things absolutely that they don't want to hear, you know, is also very important. So there's certain ways to distribute that tough love. Okay, and it's still yeah, again, and it, yeah, and it matters who you're giving it to, right? Exactly. Some people are just I'm not going to get anywhere with that, so <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to exactly, give it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely person based. Right on. Yeah. Now, do you find that doing that? Uh, it's funny. I, I thought that you, because I've read some of your Facebook posts, and mm-hmm. you're pretty outspoken, I guess, mm-hmm. as a, what you want to say, an advocate, a- a- activist. activist. Yeah. But I yeah. did not know that there's, which I, I'm mm-hmm. happy to hear that mm-hmm. you have also, you're doing the work. You're actually trying to heal your community as best you can. But does that take a toll on you personally at a point? Um, it does. Like, I, I definitely, after six years working front lines at the shelter, um, I I got like PTSD, like wow. I'd, uh, I'd never had PTSD or depression before. And then post like burnt out, I guess is the term sure. that, you know, we use in the, in the field. Mm-hmm. And I burnt out quite heavily. Um, but I learned how to recognize burnout. And Good. I think that was one of the most valuable lessons I took out of that. Um, because yeah, like the front lines work was like, was def- I definitely stayed in it too long. Okay. Um, I definitely, st- uh, but then again, I, I stayed for the people. Um, I knew the level of care I offered and the level of care I gave. <laughs> and, nice. um, and I knew if I left, the, 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 they wouldn't be treated the same way. And so I stayed as long as I could for that. And I'm thankful for it. But then again, of course, with the mental health stuff that came up out of it, right? right that was really tough. Um, a lot of secondhand trauma. That's um, interesting. Secondhand, secondhand trauma. trauma. That's yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you you deal with to go with your own personal with trauma. With my that, own trauma. Right? Yeah, exactly. Taking on. But see, um, being a, like being indigenous and but growing up in the white community, you right. know, again, I didn't like my life was good growing up. Sure. My life was good. My mm-hmm. like my life. Uh, I have no complaints, right? Um, but because of that, I've been able to. I have the capacity to take on yes. other, okay. other, and and uh, and it's been quite incredible because, yeah, since my my passion for working with indigenous people, um, me growing up, non-traumatized, <laughs> I've been able to take on other traumas, okay. and, and just be able to be like, uh, be. Like a, a like a like a like a like a like a like an indigenous face, you know, like an indigenous person who understands yeah. the spirit and understands the culture and understands the traditions, and um, and and it's actually been quite incredible connecting with yeah the indigenous people on the street um, mm. and having the yeah the capacity to um, to listen to them and to and to and just just to be there honestly because you have some right. you have some people. With, with their mental health and um, and they'll they'll be yelling or they'll be screaming right and um, all of these things they're not yelling at anybody directly but mm-hmm. they're just yelling right and I just like you know and, and a lot of the times it's it's about the abuse they've endured the abuse their children might be currently enduring um, and a lot of the times yeah I can just like enter their space and just like and just be like hey what's up like what's going on? Interesting. Like why? Like 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 I'm not here to punish you. I'm not here to, mm-hmm. you know, tell you what to do. I'm not here to tell you to stop yelling. Keep yelling if you want. But like, what's going on? Hmm. Why? You know. Just, right. And and just like giving them an opportunity to to communicate that. Right. Right. Because something's trying to come. Something. Out. Yeah. Exactly. They they have something to say, and um and I always have the time to listen, and um and so, yeah coming back to like the burning out phase mm-hmm. learning about being able to recognize burnout has been huge because now I know working back in the field again I know where my limits are I know like how much to take on okay. I know when to you know leave it at the door you know and stuff like that and yeah, uh, and just yeah, gotten yeah, a yeah. lot better at like taking care of yeah taking care of myself in that sense right on so you've learned a lot about yourself then as you've taken on this yeah now are you careful not to see yourself as a savior how do you see yourself as a, honestly a i just servant or? I, I don't know i just just a guy i just lo- <laughs> yeah i just love people okay and and i i love being with people and i know again i, I would i've been offered a lot of things in my life that i'm super thankful for and I know there's a large population out there who were never offered those same things. Right. And so in my brain, I'm like, it's just obvious. 
Like, let's just, let's just give that back. Let's just be with those people, you know? And, uh, and yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't, yeah, again, I don't like the word savior. I, I don't, I, I just, yeah, just like a, just like a guy who, yeah, likes people. Right on. Yeah, I don't know. And you're doing what comes naturally, it mm-hmm. seems like. On, yeah, honestly, it's, it's, um, I, yeah, it doesn't even feel like work. Right. You know? It's just like, yeah, I get paid to love people <laughs> every single day. And, and, and I, it's so funny because, I, you know, we look at it and yes, I'm, I'm giving them support and I'm giving them counseling or I'm giving them socks or giving them a sandwich. <laughs> but it's like in reality, they're ble- like I am the blessing that they return back to me, you know, with their humor and their stories sure. and their company. <laughs> like it's like that's the true reward hmm. you know like as much as i think i'm giving it's like the, like i'm receiving so much more and my heart is being yeah so much like yeah being filled yeah you know? yeah and and it just reminds me why i do it you know yeah yeah that, that sounds like a real yeah. sort of compassion that, that i think everyone would, would do well to maybe just try a little bit of it you mm-hmm. know it's yeah yeah compassion awareness maybe just un- honestly just like understanding. You, yeah even just like I would just, yeah, I would love to see a little bit more understanding, mm-hmm. you know, even just in a small degree. And even just like, I don't know, even just the words, like the language we use, I'm sure, sure like you've heard like the word like crackhead. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, 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 I'm again, guilty. I've used that word many times and I've definitely called, you know, people that many times, but, <laughs> but now we're kind of in a place where, yeah, I was just kind of like crackhead. Like that's like, that's so violent. That's so gross. That's you know what start. I mean? That's not, yeah. And it's, um, and now I'm just like, I'm catching myself. So it's just like, yeah, it's all about, yeah, the language we use as well when it, when we, when it comes to people, right? That's really interesting. Yeah. We talked a bit about that. I think before mm-hmm. we started rolling about mm-hmm. you were just educating me on the terms and it's right. like, because then we're not even having the same discussion is what I said. No, like, exactly. I, I call you a crackhead. It doesn't matter. It's not about the crack. <laughs> yeah, right? no, it's, it's not. not. <laughs> no, it's about the person. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's never, it's never in a positive no. light. You oh, know? you crackhead. Yeah. That's not good. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So, I, yeah, I don't know where that came from. But no, hey, yeah. that's, that's important <laughs> yeah. though. And that brings yeah. me to, well, it, mm-hmm. to me, it, it's, it's something that is on, on some, on a sort of higher level. I don't know, I'm not going to say metaphysical mm-hmm. analysis, but the way in which we're using language to make sense of our world, and you want to say that colonizers came in, and mm-hmm. part of it was using language, and mm-hmm. even today, you call somebody something, and fine, that's what they are to, to you, mm-hmm. but, but then now, in some way, now that's, they've become that to themselves. Yep. And they've, in, they've inherited that. Yep. They didn't ask for that. They didn't ask for it, no. You know? Oh, I just hear a drum make. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and, and singing too the right? singing yeah. yeah is that something you partake in ever um actually it's funny my uncle is slowly teaching me nice yeah how to like sing and drum um I, it's yeah definitely something I would love to learn more of sure not there yet but I yeah. have to say as someone who's just a ter- like a terrible musician mm-hmm. for a hobby mm-hmm. that those songs seem incredibly tough yo 100% and, and like, like the melody and, yeah and just like the, the the level their voices reach like right. the, like the, I don't know the falsetto or like just like the the, the highness of yeah. the voice and to consistently sing in that and and the fact that they you know they're like each like each word that that comes out of their mouth is you know is is the language and is a story you know and it and people you know they can just be like oh it just sounds like nothing but it's like in reality it's like such an incredible uh woven piece right right it's from deep deep and And historic like thousands some of these songs thousands of years old Mm -hmm. and it's like what like like who can we say that about any sort of you know music that we've had in the last you know two hundred years? Ever? Yeah, ever. My, my right. mind went there and I was like, no, because to go there you'd be going to like Rome or the Vikings <laughs> yeah, or something. I yeah, don't know exactly. That music. Yeah, I don't know the history behind that, but yeah, it's quite special to be able to still practice things that are thousands of years right. old and to be able to still have them. Yeah, is is so important. That and that's mm-hmm. what gets lost in so much of this is the the real richness of that of uh, the in, ab, indigenous culture mm-hmm. and of course there's many of them i was actually sitting here a few months ago with an indigenous fellow yeah and i said something to that effect and he's like well first there's how many indigenous cultures are there to yeah. begin with yeah and the tribes so yeah to sort of revisit that in my own mind and come to you it's like that's such a deep rich cultural yeah. history there man Give me one second sure i just want to um 
because I think in Canada alone um, there are there's over 630 First Nations communities that represent over 50 nations. 600 and 630 uh, indigenous communities in Canada, okay. and they represent more than 50 nations and 50 indigenous languages. Huh. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so you have to think about in each of those 50 nations, like, they all have their own type of ceremony and their own specific way, right. you know? And, and to think that that's what's left, like, imagine, imagine well, what was taken, well, you know? Sure. You know, what like, was? Yeah, imagine the Beothuk people. Imagine the songs they sang. You know, imagine the ceremony they partook in. It's like we'll we'll never know. Yeah, so much of that is just lost. Yeah, right? it's just been. Yeah, and for what? Yeah. Well, I mean, now here's one I'd like to run by you, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to work on this. I don't know if you said this or someone said it, where there's this sort of movement to just really not celebrate Canada Day mm -hmm. in a patriotic way. Yes. Which is like I can, in some way, get on board with that. But yeah. do you do you know is there because you also can't deny. Due to colonialism or not, yeah, there's a lot of progress or there's a lot of uh, prosperity in this country for millions of people. Mm -hmm. Is there a way? Is there a way to have that discussion where we celebrate Canada for what it is, mm -hmm. and, but without, <laughs> but of course not? So, how would you take that? Honestly, like, I'll just give like Thanksgiving for an example. Okay. Like I, yeah, like I, <laughs> sure. like I, like I hate Thanksgiving. Like okay. Thanksgiving is yeah. like very much a colonial holiday. Um, Thanks for what? Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but then my, my family still practices it, and of course, you know, I'm not just going to be like, no, you know, F Thanksgiving, okay. and F all of you. No, right. it's, uh, it's good. I, you're not exactly, but like in my brain, I'm like, I don't have to actively celebrate the real reason for it. Ah, you know, sure, like sure. you can, you can totally. I feel like you could take Canada Day and make it your own thing. Yep. But you need, like, again, like, yeah, like. Um, it needs to come from a deep understanding of, mm -hmm. you know, of what's happened, what's been done. And, um, and yeah, and to be patriotic about Canada at this point is just like, I, I don't know how one can be, okay. right? I feel like if Canada has a true reckoning with their history and a true exposure, you know, and a true, like, change, then, I, like, again, um, I'm super thankful to live here. You know, I, I think it's a beautiful space, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it, it offers, yeah, wealth and prosperity to so many. Um, but at the same time, on the backs of, right? Right, as a result of. Of, of, a, of a people group that lost everything, right? Yeah. And it's not until Indigenous people are treated equally that that we can be proud of, mm -hmm. you know, the space that we actually live in. Yeah. No, that's yeah. that's. I'm happy yeah. to hear that yeah. I, because I am fairly comfortable calling what occurred here a, a genocide. A hundred percent. You know, hundred percent. That, that's yeah. a recent move for me. I didn't really think yeah. about it. No, but then that's the, a, yeah. It, it comes like again. We're all on our own journey. You know what I yeah. mean? And we're yeah. all coming to terms with certain things. And then I see it in a lot of people, the progress they're made, and and just kind of how how they've been able to like internalize what's been going on, and how they've been able to. Um, change themselves, you know, positively, sure. like, you know, in a forward motion. And, and so, yeah, no, I still have, like, yeah, no, I totally understand that, yeah, the, the, the mindset change, right. you know. Because yeah. I'm trying to reckon with growing up in a fairly sheltered way, and mm -hmm. it was like Canada Day was this, was a celebration of yeah. what this land was, yeah. but, yeah. Like, well, you said mm -hmm. it best, it's like, until we reckon with what really yeah. happened, you can't yeah. really be a patriot. Absolutely. No. And again, it kind of like like that make make America great again. Sure. You know, like America was never great <laughs> to begin with. You know, right. and it's but basically what make America great again is like we miss the times where we were allowed to be you know racist completely. and stuff, <laughs> completely ignorant. You know. Sure. Sure. Yeah, and so that's just kind of the example. It's like yeah, it's like how can we be proud of a history that's been so terrible? Um, and sell and but but and just be so blind, like actively blind, right? Right. But what what the success of Make America Great Again and how many people clambered on? What does that tell us? Like the, that there's there's so many people out there like that, right? Right. <laughs> and and yeah. Is it just ignorance or is it is it hatred? It's I think hard to reconcile. It is. It. Yeah. It, it's. Um, I'm sure it's both. Right. Right. Um, but I feel like it's a, a fear. It's a it's a it's a for I think for a majority of those people it's a fear that once if they confront one thing then they have to confront everything sure you know sure where let's say you have like a like a Republican family right mm -hmm. who all love and support Donald Trump 
and then all of a sudden, you know, slowly after all of the terrible things he's done, you know, maybe one person in the family is starting to be like, okay, guys, maybe we don't idolize him like we do. <laughs> but then, and then of course, the lash out will happen, and it's like they cling to these ideologies so tightly because they don't know anything else. Right. You know what I mean? They think equality for indigenous people means inequality for them, right? Yep. When in reality, we're just trying to be, we're just trying to get a seat at the table. Right. You know what I mean? Whereas they think we're taking their seats away. But it's, that's never been the case. That's never been the case. And um, I think it's 100% fear-based. And they are just holding on to the last bit of, you know, privilege. Mm-hmm that they still have you know because again i feel like things are changing okay right? and um and and i think f- things are slowly moving forward but yeah when we talk about these minds that refuse to change 100 percent, they live in fear right. of of what they don't know what they don't understand and um and it's gonna it's a fear of losing they right. don't want to lose what they have right but it, again if they even just lost maybe a little bit of the, it could benefit you know right somebody else because whatever, but. I guess with that mindset, they're sitting there thinking, well, I am superior to those people. Mm-hmm. If suddenly they're up here with me, w- yeah. what am I? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And again, yeah, if we go back to like the Donald Trump thing, if you, if you call out one bad thing he's done, you're going to call, you, you know, you got to call out the rest of them, right. right? And so it's so much easier just to live in this bubble yep. you know of yep. everything is fine everything is happening the way it's happened and everything will continue to happen the way it has and mm. it's like yeah and and they and they i think there comes a point yeah where they willfully choose that there you has know? to be yeah a willful blindness a willful blindness yeah because no again no amount of proof provided in a colonial context will be enough Right. We could still there's still so many people in this country that sympathize with residential schools, mm-hmm. you know, and I've had conversations with people who, you know, um, talked about, oh, well, at least they learned English, you know, oh, well, at least this, at least that. Um, but at the same time, I'm oh, sorry, where was I going with this? I don't know. I liked it. Though. Um, no amount of proof. in a. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we have a lot of residential school uh, sympathizers. Right. And you could show them, you could literally show them the bodies <laughs> of the children. Sure. And their minds aren't going to change. No. Um, and, and it's like, then that's why we need, like, you know, and that's why we need that, like, complete reform, you know, of, yeah. like, the education system. And because it's like, it takes a long time to change those mindsets that have just been drilled into people for, you know, for so long. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's, you know, yeah. it's funny. I was in a situation on the weekend where uh, somebody was taking a fairly white supremacist stance on some things, mm-hmm. and I was just so stunned that I couldn't react. Mm-hmm. And and this, I'm not naming names or whatever, but this yeah. this guy, and then somebody else in the group spoke up, and they were getting into it. Sorry, and, this was in a group convo, or it was in in real life. Oh, like okay, sorry. Sitting around. Sitting around oh, okay. without giving too much away. That's okay. Here. That's okay. Yeah. Some yeah. people got into it, and I, I oh. was so stunned that I almost felt bad that I couldn't, I couldn't speak and say my point of view on the thing. But mm-hmm. I guess it, he, he, I, there was a, you said no amount of proof in the colonial context would ever be yeah. enough. Yeah. And this guy said something to the effect of, no amount. He said no matter how much we do, it'll never be enough. But mm-hmm. he was saying it from the other side of things. Like it's like no matter what we do, they'll always ask for more. Yeah. It's like. It's funny that you were actually coming to the same thing, but just on on know, opposite sides yeah. of the spectrum. I, yeah, I was, I was stunned, and I actually felt some guilt that I couldn't ex- mm-hmm. because here I do this podcast where right. I talk about these ideas, and then yeah. it came up in real life, right? And I just yeah, some yeah, sometimes I mean I feel like there's a time and place for those conversations, right? That's true too. And um, and I don't true. I don't feel like I mean you thought of it right, and sure. next time then you can speak on it yeah. right, yeah. Um, and again, and that just comes with, yeah, just catching people. Like, just right. like, you know, your friend says, you know, a, like a bad native joke or, you know, calls, you know, somebody like a, like a slur, you know. And it's just like white supremacy lives in safe spaces, you know, sure. and it lives in echo chambers and it lives in, in spaces where it never, you know, it can thrive. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's just like 
the way we start is we 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 start affecting it is like having difficult conversations. You know, call and and, and I'm not talking about like you know getting angry and mad and like no, calling you, out your friend. Just being you like, can't. hey, bro, like don't say that. That's right. wrong. Right. You know, like that's not okay. And um and and just even those little gestures, you know, will impact such positive change long term. Right. You know, just uh, having those little. Things, right in the, you know they, they use the term microaggression or whatever yeah. but it's like things this problem like you say exists on a micro level it, yes there's the mm-hmm. systemic we can talk about that right but on the micro person to person level mm-hmm. it would just take a million of those little ones to yeah. start getting the ball yeah. rolling absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah and i've you know and i've seen that growth even in myself you know yeah. and even in some of my friends you know we've come a long way and um yeah and and i feel like yeah starting like people say like change the world by changing your world yes and i know that's like super like <laughs> cliche and like <laughs> i think uh, it's kind of campy though. but no but i truly believe that i've been able to affect hopefully affect positive change on a larger scale by affecting small change on a personal level yeah right and and that's yes. and it starts it starts here it starts here in front of you it starts who's around it starts with who's around you Right. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah. Because now you've probably seen in your time because you do the activist kind of work. Mm-hmm. You, you run into some people. Maybe this is like a straw man that mm-hmm. I'm making up of a, of a white activist who's doing it for the wrong reasons. You ever see that? Um, so the thing is, it's like I like um, people will like to whatever the like armchair activists or, oh, you yeah. know, or like um, people like white saviorists, like white saviors. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. Um, honestly. I, if someone's showing up, <laughs> that's enough. Fair enough for me. I, you know, if their if their heart's in the wrong place, you know, I hope they find it. And I'm sure if they continue to do what they're doing, mm-hmm. they will. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't. You know, I when we say like activism, they're showing up for the wrong reasons. Um, I'm sure you, know, you have counter protesters, right? Well, We're there yeah. to v- like, v- like you know, really physically, the wrong reason. <laughs> physically be a wrong reason. But um, no, like you, um, I honestly feel, yeah, like some like yeah, white people that show up, they get on and with no full understanding or full knowledge. Mm. You know, sometimes they can get a bad rap, but in reality, like they're trying. Sure. You know, I truly believe if they're showing up, there is a willingness to learn. And, and that's enough for me. So let's like let's let's celebrate that, you know. Okay. Let's let's yeah, um, and yeah, and I, and I see and, and it, it, it's all about numbers. Mm. Like it, it doesn't matter, you know. Um, yeah, it, it just it, just the body. Even like I have some friends come to some protests and they've never protested in their life before, mm. but I've given them you know a good understanding, and you know they have some sort of base knowledge and some sort of passion, you know, or some sort of stirring, you know, okay. to like fight for that cause but um and but then yeah just having them show up and have them learn as they go just their physical presence is so important okay yeah that, okay that's interesting yeah. to me because yeah like i said maybe it's a straw man of like mm-hmm. the, the white savior the, right. the white activist that right. is doing it yeah again so again i don't speak for like no and know, i wouldn't want general, you to right? i wouldn't want you to um, but i guess just for me yeah um yeah i just I, I, I always I give people the benefit of the doubt. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's this what to take it back to what you were saying before, which I fully agree with, is like to change the world, you got to change yourself, mm-hmm. and, and any positive change I think happens on a one to one, like one hundred percent. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then to have these people that think, well, we got to overthrow the government mm-hmm. and replace it with what? And you're gonna tell us what to replace it with? Like, right? You know what I mean? Right. Um, it's so funny though, like for like as indigenous people, um, or even just for me personally, being indigenous, mm-hmm. you know, people like to use these like, oh, you're right wing, you're left wing, sure. you're liberal, you're conservative. Yeah, it's yeah. like, it's like, for indigenous people, it's like we existed before those wings. Th- those existed, <laughs> yeah. right? So it's like, like, like we're in reality, like we're just we're fighting for the land. Yep. You know, we're fighting for the people. And we're, we don't fall into any political spectrum. Like, we just are who we are. And, um, and we just have this overwhelming sense of responsibility, you know, to protect mm. the earth, to protect our languages, you know, and to protect our, you know, our women and children. And so, yeah, it's so funny when we talk about, like, politics and, and like, overthrowing the government and all of this stuff. Like, I have no idea <laughs> what any of that looks like. Oh, yeah. Um, all I know is 
All I know is, 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 is justice for my people. That's all I want. Yeah, in the end, kind of the bottom line. That's, yeah. that's pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. All I know is justice for my people. Yeah, yeah because again, yeah. so much of even this, so much of what you're dealing with now is a framework that was put mm -hmm. over your people in order to control and yeah. ultimately eradicate exactly. them. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's just a matter of doing what we can with what we have mm -hmm. within these colonial constructs to just disrupt, you know, mm -hmm. um, frustrate, annoy, whatever, <laughs> sure. you know, just anything to, 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 to keep the, you know, the fire burning. Right. Yeah. Right. So to that, that the, is, that is an active part of it is, is to, because you have to, right? How, how else would you? Hi, Shonen. <laughs> I heard you singing. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Love it. No, that's great. Um, sorry, where were we? Um, we were, yeah, I was just going to say like, yeah, I don't remember. It's crazy how fine the thread is that if you get away from the conversation, then it's gone. Yeah. Right. That's maybe that's welcome to my brain. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that speaks to me and you yeah. because I had that moment also where it was like, uh, yeah. whoa, are we but, just hanging out? <laughs> right. And now I know as a listener of podcasts, the listeners are like, you idiots, you were talking about this, mm -hmm. but when you're in it, you can't, you can't remember. Right. No, it was, um. We were talking about politics. I was kind of asking you about, like, part of the activism that you do is necessarily disruptive. Like, it actually... Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just kind of, like, yeah, even just, like, yeah, disrupting the status quo. Right. Because white supremacy um, thrives on normal or normalcy, thrives on um, calm, thri uh, thrives on... Status quo. Status quo, thrives on, you know... Just being allowed to roll over. Yeah, basically. Yeah. That's an, I'd like to, could you say more about yeah, that? Yeah. And so we, and when I talk about, you know, people, I talk about confronting it and calling it out, you know, right. people always think it's like going to be this loud, brash, noisy thing. Right. But again, right. It, it's all, it starts with the small things, but um, yeah, it's just like, yeah, white supremacy thrives on not being disrupted. You know, by nobody saying anything, by people forgetting about it, by just uh, like by letting it do what it was meant to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but we defeat it by disrupting it sure. and disrupting it by any means necessary. Right. Again, if it's in conversation mm -hmm. with me and you, or if it's blocking a, a railroad, you know, in solidarity right. for a land defender, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like they don't, and people are like, Oh, well you indigenous people, like you natives, you're all like, you're, you're so angry and you're yelling at us and you know, you're trying to make us feel guilty and all these things. And it's like, yeah, well, we're never like, we're, we're never meant to make you feel guilty, but it's like you, you never listened to us when we were calm. <laughs> you never listened to us when right. we were, you know, having like a normal conversation without any anger, you know, mm -hmm. like we, like I, I, I've been posting things on my Facebook for years. Right. Right. Uh, when it comes to indigenous issues and, you know, of course those same things are happening and I'm a little bit more angry about it. And I'm a little right. bit more active in my words and in my language, um, maybe a little bit more harsher, you know, and then I have people coming at me like, oh, we should be promoting like love and unity and encouraging. <laughs> and I'm just like, right. I'm just like, yeah, you never listened to us when we weren't like this. Right. right? So we're going to do it anyways, you know, and people always equate anger negatively. They equate, mm. they equate anger with hatred or they equate anger with, with something bad. Right. Interesting. But um, for a lot of indigenous people, our anger is very, is very much necessary. Mm -hmm for the movement yeah yeah it, yeah, it fuels, yeah, it, 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 in fuels some way. it it fuels it and and it's like angry for those kids who never made it home right like if your response to that is an anger right or mm -hmm. to, or isn't some sort of like what the hell is going on <laughs> you know like th 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 that's you know th there's an issue there uh, it speaks a lot about yourself yeah you if, know? You, if that doesn't anger you it doesn't anger right. you right how could it not? I mean, it would just be that you just aren't really computing what that is. You right. Picture a room full of 200 kids. Yeah. 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 For some people, you know, it's just a number and it doesn't mean anything. Right. Because right. Because they're un like, you know, they're untouched, unbothered. But it's like if you really unpack it, it's like, yeah, those were 215 children. And um, and the worst massacre ever perpetrated by the United States in one was a. Uh, in America was 300, 300 uh, mm. Lakota Sioux were killed by the 7th Calvary um, in the late 1800s, and that was 300. And that was, yeah, to this day, it's like the worst massacre in the history of the states 
um, when it comes to indigenous people, and you have 215 native kids just found in one grave, right? right? One place, and that's just what, and that's you know, and that's like two quarters of that number, and it's like, and it's only going to be more, you know? They're, yeah, they're only they're what they're on 535 now, right? Yeah, was they it found? Um, really? Yeah. yeah, they did today. I'll sh- uh, oh, let me great. see if I can find. There was Kamloops, and then there was. Um, Oh, sorry, I don't want to waste your time. No, no. Oh, well, well, anyways, yeah, it's up to three, three thirty-five or something okay. today. And again, yeah, that's when I say like Canada, like Canada has no more excuses. No. Like there, there's a reckoning happening, and the more like, you know, Canada has such a stereotype of like, oh, we are like these fun, polite. Loving <laughs> hockey players who drink maple syrup, and we say sorry, right? And it's like yeah. I, I say to people, I'm like, racism, racism is as Canadian as hockey, and racism is as Canadian as the beaver. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like these things that are so synonymous with Canada. You know, racism is definitely um, in there, and it's just like a matter of um, showing the world, yeah. right? That. A ge- like a genocide happened here you know it's like if you think like it's like if you only learned about it when you graduated high school you think about like all of the other countries in the world that have no idea no idea you know right we're not even teaching our own exactly yeah. we're not even teaching our own country these things Man. and so yeah um it's going to be quite horrific the discovery of the more bodies but mm-hmm. it, it's going to need to happen it needs to happen yeah and it's yeah yeah it, it's yeah. it really got me thinking maybe about a year and a half ago about about okay, if we're going to call it a genocide and I want to call myself a Canadian, mm-hmm. I have to necessarily take that into my identity and be like, I am living on the back of a genocide, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like you, and then I thought to myself, well, no, I don't. I, I can choose not to, but it's like, I don't think you can. No. I, I think if you call yourself Canadian, Canadian you have to reckon with it. You have to, to it. reckon with that, you know. And, yeah, and even like, like the missing and murdered Indigenous women, sure. you know, like still happening to this day, right? Still. And, um, and it's like... You know, people will talk about genocide as a past tense, but it's like it's ongoing. Like, sure, right? Like we're in it. Continues. You know, and um, and we talk about you know well, the, with the pandemic that happened. You know, people are like, oh, like we're all living in like this post-apocalyptic world, and it's like <laughs> for indigenous people, ever since contact, we've been living in a post-apocalyptic world. You know, like for sure. us, you know, like this is. Um, you know, we're living in the land being occupied by a foreign invader still to right. this day, right? And um, and it's like just a matter of looking at them like that versus, you know, someone will say, oh, well, they, ne- they need to stop being victims. They need to stop playing the victim. I've heard that so many times about indigenous people, huh. you know, like they just need to get over it. They just need to move on, right. you know, and I just like I want to correct that <laughs> saying or that idea that it's like how can we possibly move on when our people are actively still being killed by both state and settler still know? actively being mm-hmm. sure can yeah. you t- tell me more about that yeah well like you, like um police like still to this day you know the overrepresentation of indigenous people being killed by police um mm-hmm. like even um like in winnipeg there was a 16 year old indigenous girl alicia hudson i think her name was you know killed by killed by cops um and then you have there was a, a woman in um in the maritimes an indigenous woman the police went for a welfare check ah i should know her name um but, i know the yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah but then you know they, they, ended shot up, her? they ended up shooting her and yeah. killing her you know and i think it was over within three months the police had killed like three yeah indigenous people and and um and and you have to think about joyce Equan who went to a hospital and so it's not just the poli- public servants in general like the hospital system is super racist towards indigenous people where Joyce Yakwan went to a hospital in Quebec and she, as she lay dying yes yeah, she they were recorded talking about herself it. yeah they were calling her you know a dirty indian and that she would be, yes. be she was only good for sex and that she'd be better off dead and that's just you know and that's just, just one one day. video of one woman you know imagine emergency rooms you know, countrywide. And so, yeah, it's like, how can we, you know, we celebrate our doc, we celebrate all of yeah. these public servants. And mm-hmm. it's just like, again, it's back to being patriotic where, yeah, pa- mm-hmm. you know, being proud of those things is, yeah, very colonial mm. when, like, they're actively destroying lives, you know, to, 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 to some degree, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, for sure. You have, to, you have to reckon with both sides of it. Yeah, absolutely. Another one that came to mind is it, 
in Saskatchewan is it Bushy Colton Bushy Col- oh my goodness yeah it's like yeah okay he was trespassing and he was shot mm-hmm. and then was that guy acquitted or yeah Gerald Stanley walked free how can you uh, the, it, oh my god how can so, you shoot yeah they um I'm guilty of not knowing the facts of the case but mm-hmm. I, I don't see a way that that yeah basically he was on there's a really good documentary called uh, we will stand up okay and um, and it chronicles the whole thing, basically the truth of what happened. Um, and yeah, Gerald Stanley basically he got off on a hang fire, mm. which which I don't really understand it too much. Basically, um, it's like you shoot the gun, and or no, there's a bullet still in the chamber, and after you shoot, and there's like a delay, and it doesn't fire right away. And so basically, yeah, Gerald Stanley got off with like this super bogus um, thing. And um, it was actually quite traumatic. Like he, the same handgun that was like used to kill Colton was like given to Gerald Stanley in the courtroom to like reenact Whoa. what had happened. And so that's just, and that's just like, like oh, that how messed idea? up, how messed up, you, right. know? you know, and his body was left uncovered for 24 hours. Um, and, and it rained that night and washed away like so much of the evidence sure. and, and like the crime scene investigator who based all of her findings didn't even go to the scene. She based it all on pictures that they took. Like, so just like there's so many things on so many levels, right. like it was like super injustice. Um, and even just like in my own family, mm-hmm. um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but there were two Métis hunters murdered yeah, in northeastern Alberta. Yeah. You made some posts about that Yeah, one, right? so that's, yeah, my uncle, my uncle Morris. That was your uncle? And my cousin Jacob, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and, and the men who killed them have almost gotten out of prison like four times now on bail. And, um, and legally, you're only allowed to apply for bail twice also, which is like super messed up. It just kind of shows you the system. Um, but it was actually wild and super sad. Um, but the day that I got the news, you know, that my cousin and uncle were murdered by two settlers, my first thought wasn't mourning. Mm. My first thought was, they're going to walk free. Like, mm. my, my, heart, my, my mind immediately went to Colton Bushy. Sure. I was super familiar with that case, super familiar with that trial. And before I could even be sad that my cousin and uncle were dead, I was worried <laughs> that the system was going to fail them. Right, that justice wasn't going to be... Yeah. Yeah, and so that kind of just shows you all you need to know about our our, our system, our judicial yeah. system, and, and the experience of being Aboriginal in that system mm-hmm. is just that's yeah. you know your yeah. somehow it, your life is yeah. less than it was never made to benefit us in any way, any sense. And so when form. I right exactly right, it wasn't mm-hmm. ever made to benefit you in mm-hmm. any way. And it's just it's it's remarkable that that persists in such a way where it's like you, your benefit is still never taken into account mm-hmm. a lot of the time to this day yeah yeah to this day yeah yeah you know would I, you like to talk more about that yeah with your uncle? i could um so basically they the the killers and it's a very it's the same like colton bushy was was accused of stealing right was accused of being a thief right. and so it justified right his horrific death even right. then even if he was right it's not you worth. still don't kill somebody over 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 a thing no um but basically no. the yeah in my in my family's case um yeah the the two men that killed them yeah tried to tried to claim that you know my cousin and uncle were stealing but in reality like that's so far from the truth right but you know canada is like a place where a settler can kill a native man and turn himself into the police and then plead not guilty that's exactly what he did. That's what the, what one of them did, and then the other one wasn't arrested until two months after the fact. Two um, months. Two months. Yeah, that's. And they it, knew who it and was. And they knew exactly who it was. Yeah, um, and so, that was kind of the start. And so again, it started off right. Right. Against us. Um, right. And then. Yeah, and then they were uh, they were able to apply for bail once through the provincial court. It was denied. Mm-hmm. We had to show up to court for that. Um, and then the once you get if you get it denied on a provincial level, you can go through the um, or what's it, the Supreme Court? What's ours? Um, court of Appeal? No, the, the the top one. Yeah, Supreme Court. The Supreme. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking America. Oh no, yeah, 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 yeah. The Supreme Court. So yeah, they they uh, then they applied for a bail appeal through the Supreme Court, and then that was denied. 
And then on yeah, and then on a separate occasion, they tried to use rising COVID numbers apparently in the remand center to get out, um, and then just like a whole bunch of like bullshit right tactics. Um, Where is it at right now? Um, they're at so basically, they're we we have like a very strong feeling that you know like justice is going to be served in our case, but um, with the with this family like the the killers, they um they had they've they're the trial was originally set end of October, beginning of November. Okay. Um, so now that they've run out of bail appeals mm. and ways to do that, they fired their defense team. Oh. And so by firing their defense team, the trial dates get canceled. Oh. And so now we have to go back to court again coming up. It's actually on June 21st oh. to pick new court dates, but probably not going to be for another year, right. maybe two years. So basically what all they're doing, they're just grasping, like they're just trying sure. to prolong their time. And so, and it's like, and, and in those two years, what other, you know, what other bullshit are they going to pull? Right? right. Well, exactly. Yeah. And so it's all very much calculated and it's all been like very much working against our family, but yeah, we've still just been like showing up and like hosting rallies in front of the law courts. Oh yeah. Um, and it's actually wild. Um, the killer's family, they've come and they've counter-protested. Um, one, three people came. One person had a sign that said race had nothing to do with it. Mm. The second person had a sign that said bail is a constitutional right. Okay. And the third person had a sign that said hashtag free, or hashtag fair trial, John 8. So they're trying to like portray these men, these as good Christian men, you oh, know, that I would see. never do any sort of wrongdoing and, 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 you know, they're trying to portray my cousin and uncle as, you know, these dirty thieves, you know, sure. kind of got what they deserved. But in reality, yeah, they were just like my uncle and cousin were, were, were hunted down, were shot down on the side of the road, right? you know, just in, in cold blood. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, now, yeah, as an indigenous person, it's like, this is what it's like right. to be native in Canada, just another to be day. native in this, in this racist judicial system, right? you know, because if you think about it, if two native men killed two white people in that same way, there would like those native men, they wouldn't, you know, there would, there would be no chance for them to get out ever. It'd be over. It'd it would be, be over. over. It'd be cut and dry. And I, you know, I remember back in, uh, I think it was two years ago, there was that tourist couple that were murdered in northeastern or northwestern British Columbia. Oh, they're like German or something. Yeah, by that port, Al- by those two Port Alberni teens. For sure, yeah, right. Yeah. He um, shot one. Yeah, yeah. They killed. They killed three people actually oh. in BC along the road, and there was oh. that big manhunt. Remember throughout, throughout Canada. Oh yes. That mass, and they ended up in like northeastern Manitoba, right. all the way from British Columbia. And they killed themselves before. Yeah, they, they were, did. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I forgot about yeah. that. Um, yeah. But I remember this specifically because I remember when those two white tourists were killed. Right. In northeastern BC immediate calls for justice you know sure. RCMP throws every resource available right you know and uh, and then when my cousin and uncle were murdered it barely made the local news <laughs> and uh, and then all of a sudden you know you have the comments you have you, you see the news articles for that for the the tourists who were murdered you see the news articles online and you see the comments and you know it's oh this is such a tragedy and you know we need justice and we right. need to bring those killers to jail and they deserve to rot in hell and all these things you know but then on my cousin and uncles um like the 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 news reports sure, right that sure, came yeah. through about their murder you know you see the comments oh well what were they doing oh what were they oh doing? why why were they why were they there right oh there must be two sides to this story right you know oh um you know they must be they, they must have been doing something shady you know yeah. in order for them you know so when indigenous people are involved mm-hmm. you know People always ask those questions. Indigenous people are somehow always responsible for their own horrific deaths in in this colonial system, right? Where two white people get murdered, and you know, it's the 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 the, the, the response from the public is so much more right. different, right? It's hard to reckon that. And I'll tell you when I when I sat down with Brittany Ohi mm-hmm. in February, mm-hmm. and she was the one that recommended you come on the show. Mm-hmm. I was in a different place then, and I didn't. I hadn't reckoned with this stuff the way that I even have now six right. months later or four months later. Right. It still hits me in a way where I cannot make sense of it. But rather than somehow find a way around it logically, I just have to just let these stories be told. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's impossible for me to really understand. Right. No, it is. It is. Yeah. And I don't expect anybody to understand. Right. right? But yeah, it's just a, it's a matter of just like listening and, and being aware that this is how it works. These right. are settler tactics and they've existed 
forever. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like settlers have been killing indigenous people and claiming, th claiming the th like they settlers know they can throw the thieving Indian card into the court. Doesn't matter what they've done. <laughs> all they have to say are those words, and they have a trial on their hands. Right. You know. Oh, there's got to be some substance to that the thieving Indian the thieving Indian and because that, that again is it seems to me uh, uh, the colonial I guess judicial mm -hmm. idea of like personal property mm -hmm. is, is, is property. everything right? yeah exactly RCMP protect property not people right right and um, and it showed in that yeah in, in the Colton Bushy case like after after Colton Bushy had died after Gerald Stanley killed him um, RCMP showed up to his mom's house to give him his, the mom, his mom, the news of the murder, right. they showed up with tactical gear. They had their guns drawn. They went house, I remember they, they, that. they yeah. surrounded the house. They went room to room. They were smelling his mom's breath to see if she was drunk. Right. And when she collapsed after they gave her the news her son was dead, they literally picked her up off the ground and said, like, what is wrong with you? And they shook her, <laughs> thinking she was intoxicated. What's and wrong I, with me? Right? Yeah. And I'm just like... Like that, that shouldn't happen to a person, you know. And 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 and, and again, it was the RC and the RCMP were found. They destroyed evidence that really? night. They destroyed evidence, and there's proof that they destroyed evidence. But of course, this is now released. That that news was actually only released like a month ago, f three years removed from the trial, right? So or two years removed from the trial. So now people, will, oh, they destroyed evidence. Whatever, it's all done. Oh, that's you know. And Gerald Stanley made money off of the murder. What? So How? The, the the community started to go fund me to support his legal expenses and uh, and and they 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 like overshot their goal. Oh. And so um, and he was I he was a Canadian hero. People were calling Gerald Stanley like a Canadian hero and some of the comments online about like what had happened, you know, I saw a comment, "Oh, he shouldn't like Gerald Stanley shouldn't have left any witnesses, you know, then he wouldn't have to deal with this." Huh. Or um, "Oh, maybe Colton shouldn't have been stealing, you know, maybe he wouldn't have died." You know, you just hear all of these things. Um, and another very mm. famous uh, colonial saying when it comes to that. Have you ever heard of the terminology uh, shoot, shovel, shut up? <laughs> or SSS? Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to uh, do a little backstory here. I think it was during the Ralph Klein era. Mad cow disease mm. was happening, and um, and some farmers were talking about. Uh, I think it was like a town hall. I can't remember specifics, but basically, I was like, "Well, if one of my cows gets sick, am I just expected to like shut my whole plant down?" And then Ralph Klein, it was like off the book apparently, but he was like, uh, "Shoot!" He basically said, "Shoot, shovel, shut up. Right. Shoot the cow, bury it." Don't talk about it, right? right? Um, but then that terminology um, switched to thieves huh. all of a sudden. So now when, like, you know, you and it's kind of, it's horrific too because, um, you know, on, after the Colton Bushy murder, mm -hmm. after J.L. Stanley killed him, you know, you just, all, and all of the, like, CBC, all of the news, all of the news articles posting about it, you see SSS. SSS, SSS, and all these white people. Just oh, in the comments. In the comments. Wow. So it's just like this universal like coded, language yeah. code, yep. you know. And um, and you think about SSS, shoot, shovel, shut up. You think about our missing and murdered Indigenous women, yeah, right? You think about the Highway of Tears in northeastern mm. right, in British Columbia, and you think about all of those rural properties on that highway. That they have hundreds and hundreds of acres. How easy is it for them to hide a body? you know, on their property, right? Yeah. And so it comes back to, yeah, it's like this, this, this shoot, shovel, shut up, this colonial mindset that it's like, it's open season for indigenous people. It's open and it always has been, you know, and now the world is slowly, I am hoping, you right. know, society is slowly <laughs> starting to see that. But um, yeah, in Colton, Colton Bushy's case really um, exposed that, exposed um, basically all of the problems within the judicial system in one court case, you know? And so I'm, oh, there's a spider. Oh. Um, and I'm hoping with, like, my cousin and uncle's court case, um, yeah, like, justice will be served and that, you know, this is, like, um, I, feel, I don't know, I like to say it, it's, like, just kind of where we're at in general mm. as a society. I like, like, you know, white supremacy's last stand, sure. you know, to some degree, mm -hmm. I hope, yeah, okay. right, where... Um, I think, yeah, with my cousin and uncle's trial, it'll be a turning point. Um, especially because, like, um, like, the people who killed them, 
one of them like owns an oil field company oh. in, in 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 Glendon, you know, and one of the and he was one of them is like the former agriculture society president. So like you know you have power, sure. you have status, mm-hmm. you have money, you know, <laughs> and you have privilege. Yeah, and it's like you're that's your classic villain. You know <laughs> what I mean? You know yeah, and uh, and and for this and this community is still just in defense of the killers like the community as a whole and a lot of i'm sure a lot of white people in rural communities you know Mm -hmm. um yeah even just to see the comments online about like you know oh well your cousin and uncle shouldn't have been stealing and and beating people up and and one of them described what had happened as a gunfight that my cousin and uncle somehow lost a gunfight a gunfight yeah it was like guns were pulled and sadly you know there was a winner and there was a loser and um and even just to hear that that to hear their murder being negated to a to a loss you a know loss. to to, wow. to something that they lost that you know they fought, they they fought for yeah, yeah you know a fight is two equal sides you know yeah. um, fighting together and um, and it's actually just like to see that yeah there was one specific comment yeah talking about their murder as like a gunfight that they had lost but that 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 is also like a very colonial mindset mm-hmm. and I, I kind of mentioned before like wound, the wounded knee massacre sure. And so massacres in the United States were all portrayed as battles in the history books. Every yeah. single massacre perpetrated was like, oh, the battle at Wounded Knee, the mm-hmm. battle at Sand Creek, the battle at this, the battle at that. Um, and so the Wounded Knee, the battle at Wounded Knee was, you know, the Lakota Braves fighting the 7th Cavalry, okay. right? But in reality, it was like the indiscriminate slaughter of 300 women and children. Mm. Um, and, um, and 23 transgressional medals of honor were awarded for that battle. And that is the most medals of honor ever given out for any single battle, World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Afghanistan, Iraq. Wow. 23 medals of honor were given out for, for the slaughter of like, women and children. And, and, um, and it kind of just shows you, like, for the, colonial, for the colonial mind, it's like, oh, well, the, the natives lost. You know, mm. that was just a battle that they lost. You know, yeah. there was a winner and there was a loser. And it's just so wild to see that mindset that originated, you know, or that didn't originate, but like existed during that massacre to still see it perpetrated, you know, in a Facebook uh, comment directed at my family, you yeah, know. Hundreds of years later. Hundreds of years later. Isn't yeah. that crazy that it's the, it is ultimately the same mindset, mm-hmm. the settler mindset? 100%. And, and, they, and they exist, and it's, and like I said, like white supremacy just transcends time. Right. And, those white, and those mindsets, you know, they transcend time because white supremacy is always being withheld mm-hmm. in whatever those structures that allow those mindsets to exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want to throw something out, and I don't want you to take it the wrong way. Of course, yeah. Um, it, it's important to see, again, yes, there's two sides to whatever happened, of course. Mm-hmm. It, it, do you have to be careful to make sure to place the, necess- the necessary responsibility on on indigenous people when something like this happens, or is it always their behavior is in response to the colonizer and that they are somehow? Um, I guess if you think about it, like, um, I guess when it comes, it comes like I know what you're getting at. It's like uh, like the whole mindset, you know. Well, like like natives are thieves. Right. Um, it's like it's not always just natives who are thieves, right? Sure. But, but they're common, you know, like they're um, like crime mm-hmm. stems from addiction, yeah. and addiction stems from poverty. And so 90% to 90 to 95% of these property crimes are usually addiction related, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so if the person who is committing these crimes had the actual proper supports to take care of their traumas, Mm -hmm. right? It wouldn't lead them down that path, right? And so for the fact that, you know, indigenous people have just been like completely and actively, you know, decimated Mm -hmm. in this country, all of those traumas translate right into poverty, into crime, into addiction. And so um, it's like addressing like the the the, the 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 crime isn't the real issue, sure. right? It's the it's the it's the systems that are actively you know still oppressing those people committing the crimes, you know. And again, it's not always indigenous people, right? But um, they're the ones who are always the scapegoats for that, right? Because um, it's so easy, mm-hmm. right, to, to to paint them as that. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I like the I like the yeah. way you took that, and that's mm-hmm. probably right. It's like, yeah. yes. and again, and I'm not saying like rural crime rates are through the roof. Absolutely, <laughs> sure. that's not. Yeah, and like I and I'm not saying that. I'm just nope. saying that it's it's so much bigger 
than, you know, your quad getting stolen. Right. You know. Right, 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 right. And, uh, yeah, and people don't want, yeah, people, yeah. They people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that, no. Right, it, uh, that's a great distinction to make there is, like, mm. uh, I like the way you took it, where it's, like, yes, crime is a result. Like, mm-hmm. there's, there's factors mm-hmm. that lead to the crime. Absolutely, right? and, yeah. You could, take, you could take the race out of it. Yeah, exactly. You could. You could, yeah. Yeah, I'm not again, asking. Yeah, I'm no, but, uh, to, but also, but yeah, but I mean, like, there's white people who are struggling, right. like, with addictions, you know. And again, like, even the white people that are stealing, addiction is 100% involved, right? Yep. Um, yeah. And, um, but yeah, but it's, yeah, it's the indigenous people. Like, but then a white person being arrested for a petty theft mm-hmm. um, and an indigenous person getting arrested for petty theft, you put them in the same courtroom, one's getting off <laughs> a lot easier. Sure. Right. Yeah, and yeah. that's just statistically. Yeah, we've seen that. Yeah, exactly. So, will what, what is what do you do day to day just to 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 uh, I guess rage against the machine, so to speak, but to to, to disrupt and like what are, you know how do you I guess how do you balance your identity with with having to live daily life? If that's um, oof, I I I how do I balance? I guess it's just like. A matter, I guess, like self care is mm. definitely like big for me, especially sure. like working with um, the community that I do and the type of things you know I interact with um, can be like quite heavy. It's just yeah, again, it's just like a lot of heavy things, mm-hmm. kind of like on sure. all fronts. But um, I don't know, like I'm I'm a very hopeful person, and I've always been a very hopeful person, and so by by being that, it's def it definitely helps stem like the trauma and stem the stress mm. and stem the sadness. Um, like I'm a very emotional person. Okay. Um, and so like, I'm not, a, like I'm not a afraid to cry. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid to get angry. Um, and I'm not afraid like about like what people will think of me mm. in those moments. And so that also helps just kind of just living sort of like shame free. Mm. Um, nice. you know, and just like, um, just, doing what I think is best um, because it's gotten me to this point, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's just a matter of, um, yeah, just like taking care of myself, um, taking care of my mental health, you know, mm-hmm. the proper medications, um, sure. you know, going to, I actually have, I'm, I'm slowly in the process of starting to go to therapy, which mm. is like super exciting. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I'm really excited to do that because I know that'll be super beneficial. Um, yeah. And I, I honestly, yeah, I just like, I don't, I I can't really say what I do specifically. No, that's, you know, mm -hmm. I just kind of do it. Yeah. Well, that's good. Shooting from the, like from the heart and just following the path. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I very much live like with my heart on my sleeve and Mm -hmm. and I'm very much, I, I, I I can be very compulsive Mm -hmm. and just, you know, like make rash decisions sometimes, but at the same time, like I, I trust myself and I know. I know what I'm doing is good, and I know, um, I know I am here today because somebody before me like loved me so much, right? Mm-hmm. Like my ancestors before me loved me so much that I exist today. And I like to say like I am my ancestors' wildest dreams, <laughs> right? Um, and it's so incredible to be. All, like you know, we talk about the system actively, you know, working against Indigenous people. But mm-hmm. to be a person in the system that's a threat to yeah. the system, okay. you know, is kind of empowering, you know, to a degree. You know, no, like you know, going to sleep at night knowing that I'm a threat to Canada's existence, right? It's <laughs> kind of like, whoa, that's pretty cool, you know. Like I can take some pride in that, True. right? And and know that, um, yeah, that what I'm doing is. I, I'm on the right side of history, if mm. that makes sense. No, that's right. Yeah, I've heard that said. Yeah, sure. Yeah, how do you how do you balance? Because I guess I'm curious then about like indigenous concepts of justice. Mm-hmm. Like, like we said, like things will things happen. Right. People people do run afoul right. of, of yeah. the right. Yeah. Yeah. What what then would that look like to you? Justice. Um, what like, and so again, like I'm still trying to figure out. Um, yeah, we talk about how again. Yeah, there was a time right before these systems. And we hope for a time after, sure. but um, like, like I want like restorative justice. Mm-hmm. You know, is okay. definitely something that um, I believe in like quite a bit, and um, and just like uh, like like 
the culture, mm -hmm. right? I, and I've been told this so many times, like, especially from like Christians and stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, well, the culture isn't saving them. Like, look where the culture has got them. Right. And it's like, well, in the past 150 years, we've only seen the culture for what's been done to it. You know what I mean? Like, um, I would love to see all indigenous people, you know, practicing their culture. Yeah. And I feel like um, for a lot of, yeah, like people who do commit crimes or do commit, you know, bad things, um, you know, I, you know, hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like everybody deserves, you know, a second chance. And, and sometimes maybe not freedom, right? Um, and again, I don't, I honestly, when it comes to those sorts of things, like I haven't, like I still... I'm figuring it out, okay. you know, for myself sure, sure. Um, and, and what that looks like. Um, but it's the matter, it's a matter of like the people in prison who shouldn't be in prison, right? I think yep. is like the fight for when we talk about like abolishing them and defunding them. Um, but then, yeah, for the, for the, <laughs> for the ones that like really do like the bad crimes, you know, I feel like, again, yeah, there's some sort of form of justice that exists for them. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I don't know what it looks like. Yeah, no, that's yeah. okay. I mean, it's a big question. I'm it just, is, yeah. I'm curious yeah. because it does seem like some of those structures, they serve a purpose mm -hmm. oh, in, in maintaining some form of yeah. order among the people, right? Right, but, yeah. But yeah. It, but it's um, it can definitely be done a different way. Yeah. And it can definitely be done in a less oppressive way, right? A more communal way, a more positive way, you know? And, again, I don't know what it looks like mm -hmm. but i believe in that i believe something like that exists and can happen right and it's it, but because we don't know like we don't know what it's like right we no. don't know what we the weren't answer, there we weren't there yeah. exactly um but i believe yeah a, a life like that exists outside of these colonial constructs and systems but and again i'll, I'll it sucks because i probably will, won't see it in my lifetime right but right. i'm definitely going to do my part in in fighting for it Beautiful. Yeah. Well, Will, thanks for your time, man. Yeah. Really appreciate it. You're that. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> thanks great. for ha having me. This hey. was like a really good conversation. My pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. This really got me thinking about a lot of things too. Cool. Right yeah. on. Is there, is there anything you got going on or anything that people you want to draw attention to or just um, any Yeah, I words? guess if anything, I just want like, there's still a lot of people that don't know about the murder trial, like regarding my cousin and uncle. Okay. Um, so if you just like Googled um, Jacob Sam Sansom and uh, Morris Cardinal, okay. um, or even just Google like Métis Hunters Murdered Alberta, sure. you'll find articles on it. Um, there's actually a Facebook page okay. called Justice for Jacob and Morris. You guys can follow it and follow along kind of what's been going on. I know June 21st is the next court trial. Mm -hmm. It's going to be in St. Paul, Alberta. Um, I'm thinking I'm going to try to, like, organize maybe, like, a small rally. My family gathers outside the courthouse usually every time there okay. is one. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, Justice for Jake and Morris. So J-U-S-T-I-S-E. -E uh, four and then Jake is J A K E and Morris is M O R R I S. Okay. Yeah. I can link. I can link to that yeah. in, the, in the notes. Yeah. yeah. On Facebook. And, and um, on the twenty first of June, it's going to be in St. Paul. You said it's going to be in St. Paul. Okay. Yeah, and that's actually on uh, on Indigenous Day. So uh -huh. uh, I know there's going to be like events for Indigenous things here in the city, but like yeah, my family will be out there, um, and I'm going to see. Yeah, try to get try to mobilize some people. Yeah, uh, to come from the city to go out there because it's really in those communities that <laughs> that need the well, that's that need the awareness, right? Those yeah, are man. the echo chambers that you know perpetuate these harmful mindsets. And I'm not just saying rural communities; obviously, it exists everywhere. But yep. yeah, there's a pretty big. Uh, <laughs> oh man, it's it, it's it's actually shocking. Mm -hmm. I, I I interviewed for this podcast a few a few months ago a reporter and a cameraman who went out to uh, some of the Black Lives Matter rallies in. Panoka yeah. and Red Deer and wow. what a nightmare that was wow. you know? yeah. Be and, to, and then myself in February I was at the one at the legislature yeah. that, I don't know maybe you were there yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Were the clamshell yeah I yeah. was there last summer okay yeah. I was shooting yeah. for city news and it was just like to, it just nothing good was happening let's put it that mm -hmm. way nothing positive was mm -hmm. happening it no. was just yeah just chaos sometimes yeah and yeah. that's the world we're living in but I, I think like we both agree those these one-on-ones and these conversations are where maybe some good could start to, yeah to grow change things right um 
yeah, what was I gonna say? We were talking about. Um, oh yeah, like um, and it's gotten bad. Like like when we talk about like for indigenous people in mm -hmm. these rural communities, like it's life and death. Sometimes, like for well, yeah. me personally, like if I went back to my like if I went like um, if I went jogging through the back roads, sure. you know of like Bonnie or Glendon, you know, um, might not be. A good it wouldn't idea. be safe. Yeah. It wouldn't be safe for me, um, and and that's an issue. That's a problem, mm -hmm. right? And um, and yeah. So we'll just like hopefully, like that problem won't exist uh, for 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 much longer. Sure. Yeah. Man, it's interesting you say that because when I hear you say things about like you're a threat to Canada's existence, like that that rocks me to some extent because I have never felt right unsafe for right. you yourself. Have yeah. felt well, this system mm -hmm. isn't for me. Mm -hmm. This country isn't for yeah. me. Yeah, living in fear sometimes is yeah. It definitely takes its toll, mm -hmm. but at the same time, like, using it to fuel your fight and your right. passion to True. better things is like yeah, it's kind of what we have to do through through humor and and through uh, yeah through through our voices. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let's leave it there for now. I'd love to sit down with yeah. you again in six oh, months. Yeah, but <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Will, you're the man, buddy. Thank okay, you. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to the North Bank Media Podcast. If you enjoy this conversation, please subscribe on YouTube and give us a like. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe as well and leave a five star review. Thank mm -hmm. you.